First of all, let's cover what is a stock. Well, a stock is actually a share of ownership in a real company. And unfortunately, this definition is sort of lost when people are trading stocks back and forth in a frenzy because of how easy it is to place trades and buy and sell shares of these companies at the snap of a fingers. But even though people do transact stocks and trade them left and right, it is still a small piece of fractional ownership of a real company. Now, what's important to understand here is that when you become an owner of a company, you're responsible for when the company does well, but also if the company does not do well. So when you are a shareholder and you own a share or shares of a company, you're also holding a portion of the company's assets and liabilities because you have a fractional piece of ownership even though it's probably one ten thousandth of a percent or whatever it may be but it's just important to understand this that you own a real business and a real company as a shareholder and you have a portion of the company's assets as well as their liabilities now in terms of how much of that company you own the ownership stake is relative to the number of shares owned versus shares outstanding. And shares outstanding just means the total number of shares out there of this given stock. So if there were 10,000 shares and you had 1,000 shares, you would obviously own 10% of that company. And then another important thing to understand is that depending on the type of offering, many of these uh, you know, stocks out there that you can purchase come with something called voting rights, which allows you to vote in major company decisions. And this makes a lot of sense. The more shares you own, the more power your vote has. Think of it this way. It's pretty much like every one share you have allows you to cast one vote. So if you have one share and someone else has 10,000, they're going to have a larger say in whatever decision that company makes. However, as we're going to discuss later, not all companies offer voting rights, and that's an important thing to consider before making an initial investment in a publicly traded company. So we understand the purpose for why people buy shares themselves. Typically, they're looking to preserve their wealth or build their wealth through the stock market by participating in ownership of a real company. But if we turn the table here and look at the company itself, why do some companies offer shares publicly while others do not? What is the purpose of shares and why do they exist? Well, essentially, companies offer shares as a means to raise capital or raise money for ongoing operations for the business, or maybe they're looking to do an acquisition or a merger. But essentially, offering shares is just one of these tools that a company has in their toolbox as a method for raising capital uh, from investors out there. Um, however, there are many other ways that companies raise money all the time, and that is typically by borrowing it from a bank or issuing corporate bonds. And so it's probably not the most interesting thing in the world, but since we're starting off at the basics, guys, we're going to get a clear distinction between the difference between a shareholder and a bondholder, okay? Okay. So essentially, a bond is a debt obligation where you're essentially loaning some entity a set amount of money and the terms are spelled out on the bond and you're getting some amount back. So based on the credit worthiness of the bond issuer, there's going to be a set amount of yield that you earn from that bond. Some are fixed and some are variable. But the big difference here is that as a shareholder, you're an owner of the company. Um, as a bondholder, you are basically just holding debt for them and you are a debt obligation that that company has. Um, so bondholders receive interest on the principal loaned. However, one of the most important things to understand between bondholders versus shareholders is that bondholders take priority during bankruptcy filing. So if the company goes sol um, unsolvent here and they go under and then there's a liquidation, bondholders are going to get paid back first before shareholders because that is considered to be a debt obligation and debts have to be paid back before any owners of the company actually get paid.
Shareholders are last for distribution of remaining assets, and there's even something called preferred stock versus common stock, which means that you know common shareholders or common stockholders are lowest on that list to receive money. So unfortunately, typically in the stock market, if a company does in fact go bankrupt or go belly up, Oftentimes, shareholders, unless they sell their shares in the 11th hour, they end up with nothing after all of the assets are sold off and the debts are paid back. So here's a few more pointers here about bonds versus stocks. So first, let's cover bondholders. Bondholders do not see returns generated from rising profits. So a bondholder is literally just a debt obligation that company has. So if a bondholder issued or let this company borrow money and they used that money to go acquire another company and then the company that did that doubled in value the bondholder is going to see no gains from that he's just going to get that set rate of return or variable rate of return that was agreed upon when that debt was issued so they have no equity they have no skin in the game they are just kind of like a bank that loans them money and they're paid back on the terms of the bond uh, they typically receive a set interest rate only for corporate bonds, but there are variable rate bonds out there. Um, they're seen as a lower risk investment. Um, they are a crucial part of a well-rounded portfolio, but when you're younger, they're not nearly as important. In fact, these days, a lot of financial experts say if you're 30 or younger, you probably don't even need to have any bonds in your portfolio because of how conservative they are. So historically, they pay an annual return from 5 to 7%, so not nearly as much of a return as you typically see from real estate or other investments out there. Shareholders, on the other hand, profit via asset appreciation or the price of a share going up as a result of rising profits. Um, and then shareholders can also earn money through dividends, which are just regular cash payments sent to shareholders. Um, they're seen as a higher risk investment because rather than just loaning the company money, you're taking on a portion of their assets and liabilities because you're an owner. You're also last to be paid if there is a bankruptcy type situation. However, because you are taking on more risk, they historically pay an annual return of around 8 to 10%. So there is a more upside to stocks than there is with bonds. Now, the interesting thing here is that the bond market and the stock market typically behave very differently. So when people have a portfolio out there, which is just a bunch of investments, a portfolio is just a bunch of investments that you have, what you do is you put some of that money in stocks and some of it in bonds. Now, a popular rule of thumb that people often follow is you uh, take 120 minus your age, and that's typically the amount of money that you would put into stocks and the rest would go in bonds. So if we take me, for example, I just turned 26, that would mean that I should have only about 4% uh, of my money in bonds with 96% in stocks. And that's why at 26 years old, I have 0% of my portfolio in bonds. Once I turn 30, I might do 10% or 5%, but for the time being, I'm just 100% stocks, real estate, other stuff, bonds just are not interesting to me. And based on how much time I have to allow my money to grow, they're just not a priority for me. However, if you are, you know, in your 30s, 40s, 50s, bonds are going to be something that are a part of your portfolio. And it's important to understand that, you know, they don't always go in the same direction in terms of value. So, for example, let's say in a fair market value situation, you were to put money into a portfolio of stocks and bonds, and you decided to do 50-50. Half of your money went in stocks, you were an equity owner in these companies, the other half went into bonds. You basically loaned money and you were a, you know, about basically a bank for this company. But let's say, for example, after that 50-50 allocation, you know, the stock market goes on a tear and the bond market stays relatively flat. Well, over time, what some people choose to do is to allocate less money into stocks and more into bonds. Um, this is typically what people do here, favoring one asset over the other, is if stocks are soaring, a a lot of people will rotate money out of stocks and into those bonds. On the other hand, let's say, for example, we're in a bear market and a bull market simply means stocks are going up. Bear market means stocks are going down. 
Oftentimes in a bear market, you'll see people actually rotate out of bonds and put more into stocks. Because typically speaking, during a market correction, bonds are going to hold up better than stocks. So even if you started off at that 50-50, some people, depending on market conditions, will actually allocate more or less to bonds versus stocks just based on the overall market. And even if you do just simply decide to do one of those portfolio rules of 120 minus your age, and let's say you're putting 10% in bonds, 90% in stocks, you still need to rebalance that portfolio because those numbers are going to change. So even if you just want to set it and forget it, you still need to check it and rebalance, okay? So what does rebalancing mean? Rebalancing means allocating more or less money to asset types. So typically, this is what a lot of people do. During a bull market, stocks often become overvalued, so they should often carry less weight in your portfolio if you're looking to mitigate some of that risk or avoid it. On the other hand, in a bear market, stocks typically become undervalued and at that point could often carry more weight in your portfolio, allowing you to have more upside. So that's typically how people use stock and bond allocations. They either leave it at that and then rebalance once in a while, or based on the overall market conditions, they may rotate more or less money in and out of bonds and stocks um, just to try to mitigate or lessen some of that risk. All right, guys, so that's the difference between shareholders and bondholders and stocks versus bonds. And we understand now that stocks are a way for a company to raise capital. But how do the stocks get there in the first place to where you can even open up an app on your phone and buy them? Well, initially, for the first time a stock ever trades, they have to go through something called an IPO or initial public offering. So let's go ahead and cover what that is now. So a company attempts to raise capital via a public offering of shares in the company. So typically you have a company in a startup mode that starts off pretty small, then they raise funding. They're still a private company, but they raise funding uh, through a couple of different rounds. And then once they become large enough, they typically have an IPO, which is also a way for those early on investors to eventually sell some of their shares and you know get some of that money for their efforts. Because um, what typically happens during an IPO is once that company goes public, a lot of those early investors and people who started on with that company years ago, assuming there's no lockup period, they'll often sell off some of their shares and new investors who never had the opportunity before to buy those shares, take up those shares because they want to buy into that company. But it's kind of like the only good option a company has if they're looking to, you know, make money. If you start up a company and you have a startup, there's basically two exits. You're either going to be acquired by a publicly traded or privately traded company that just wants to buy you. Or you're going to have an IPO and become a public company, which would allow these early investors to have a means of making some money from their shares and being able to sell some. So how does the IPO process work? Well, you have somebody called an underwriter who works with the company to set a target price per share. And the price for an IPO is based on the perceived interest in the public offering. So for example, Airbnb had an IPO this year. That was one that people were pretty interested in. So the perceived interest was high and the share price was higher. But the interesting thing here is that um, you don't even have the opportunity to buy these shares at the IPO price. That's because there's a different group of investors out there called institutional investors who unfortunately have the first choice to purchase shares and these shares are purchased at the actual IPO price. So what you might find sometimes with a company that goes public is maybe you hear about it and they say the IPO price is going to be $30 and then that day you look up the stock and it's already trading at 40 because it jumped up a bunch, you know, 25% or whatever that is. That's because only the institutional investors were able to buy shares at the IPO price. Then, based on the demand on the market, when the public, when the retail investor is trying to buy, 
that immediately pushes that price up to a higher level. And then if some of these institutional investors or people within the company that don't have a lockup decide to sell, you're buying them at that premium. So unfortunately, IPOs can be pretty risky territory. Uh, I tend to not really touch them uh, because oftentimes they come out of the gate red hot. Uh, they trade for a premium and then they settle back down to or often below that original IPO price. Uh, so once they trade on a secondary market, that's when other retail investors can buy shares and stocks may trade higher on the secondary market, as we said, depending on the level of interest in that company. So for a small investor, it's very difficult to be invited into an IPO because it's typically like a billionaire's club where you got to have a ton of money and you got to be one of these institutional investors willing to buy tons of shares at that IPO price. It's also high risk territory because of the fact that um, these are companies that are not necessarily proven as public companies. They've done well maybe as private companies, but um, you don't have much of a operating history to go off of because a lot of private companies don't share a lot of information about earnings, revenue, etc. Um, you will also often see drastic price fluctuations uh, as the market sets the price for the stock. It's a brand new asset that's never traded before. And so buyers and sellers are collectively, uh, through their buying and selling, setting a price of what do people believe this, uh, this stock is actually worth per share. So I added this little Ryan's Thoughts section here, guys, to include basically my opinion here. And again, this is not financial advice, guys, but this is pretty much what I follow myself. Most investors should avoid investing in a stock for a few months after the IPO. Unless you're like certain that you want to own this stock for like five to 10 years, typically I would not touch a stock a couple months after it IPOs until it settles on a price. Also, unless you can get in early, wait for the price to settle and for the excitement to drop off because almost always it does, people buy it, they get tired of it, and then they sell. And then enough people sell that the price goes low enough, and then you probably are gonna get a much better deal on those shares. Look at IPOs, guys. Almost all of them tend to go down before they go back up, so don't FOMO into it just because you wanna own the shares. So just to show you guys a few examples here, Airbnb did go public at an IPO price of $68, but there was a lot of demand for it on the secondary market. So one once it was available for trading, a lot of institutional investors and early investors unloaded shares, but it traded at a massive premium starting off at 139 per share. And while I did say a lot of stocks go down after IPO, it's not always the case. This one actually went up and it's now trading at 214 per share. But the important distinction here is that during that IPO process, Airbnb only got $68 per share from the institutional investor. So even though the share price is now worth 214, that doesn't actually make Airbnb any additional money. It made money for the early investors or those institutional investors who bought shares during the IPO. And then for an example here of an IPO that didn't go well at all, just to show you how risky these can be, is Casper, uh, which is a sleep company. I believe they sell the mattresses in a box. Anyway, they had an IPO at $12 per share. And as soon as they hit the secondary market, they traded below that IPO price, which was not a good sign at all. And then this thing went on a landslide down to, it looks like maybe three bucks a share. Now it has recovered to about 10. But that's how IPOs, sometimes they're great, sometimes they could be your worst nightmare. That's why, as a beginner, I don't think there's something that really should be on your radar unless it's a company you want to own, like I said, for like five or 10 years, and you don't care if it you know, goes on a landslide in the short term. All right, guys, so hopefully you have a good understanding of IPOs now, and you just understand where shares come from, what they are, and the difference between shares versus bonds. Uh, we got like 200 slides here to cover with you guys, so I am going to pick up the pace here a little bit because this is just some quick information here. So let's now talk about stock symbol. Well, a stock symbol is a unique series of letters used to identify a security. And a security is just a fancy word for a stock. A stock symbol is used to execute trading orders. And stock symbols are often referred to as the ticker symbol or ticker tape, if you've ever heard of those terms used before. Um, you typically have two major exchanges that people use to trade stocks. It's the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. 
New York Stock Exchange listed stocks have three letters or less, while NASDAQ listed stocks have four letters or more. Um, that's nothing you need to know. It's pretty useless, trivial information, but I don't know. It might win you some brownie points at, you know, your next social gathering. So that is a stock symbol. These days, you don't even really need to know it because most brokerages allow you to just search for the name of the company. Uh, but we'll cover a few examples. Uh, for example, Apple is AAPL. And then Google, uh, there's two different types, but it's like G-O-O-G or G-O-O-G-L. Uh, and that's actually based on the voting. Some of those shares have voting rights and some do not, but that's a little bit above and beyond the scope here. Um, but that's just a way to identify a stock. Now let's talk more about a stock exchange. This is simply a market for buying and selling securities. It connects a buyer with a seller. So just like you'd have an open air market where a bunch of merchants come together who sell different things, similar to a stock exchange, a bunch of people virtually who own shares come together and trade shares back and forth based on whoever wants what and what they're looking to sell. Now, oftentimes a stock is referred to as a listed stock and listed stocks are ones that trade on major exchanges and in America, that's New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. That's all I trade. I very rarely have ever traded a non-listed stock on a less desirable exchange. Um, it, typically, those are called penny stocks or something like that. I don't touch them. Um, and if, when I have in the past, I've lost a lot of money. So I recommend sticking to listed stocks. There's thousands to choose from. Penny stocks, over-the-counter markets, not very desirable exchanges. Foreign countries also have their own stock exchanges. For example, there's TX, uh, TSX, which is the Toronto Stock Exchange. So here in the US, we use New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. So that's the basics on a uh, stock symbol and exchanges. Now let's talk a little bit more about the idea of a bull market. One of my favorite sayings out there is that a bull market means prices are bull, uh, as in their, you know, bullshit because that's often what happens is prices are just ridiculous. That's one of my favorite ways to remember this. Anyway, a bit more information here. During a bull market, share prices are rising. Most investors are buying. Bullish investors make money from rising stock prices, similar to the way that a bull attacks. You can see this guy over here getting attacked. Um, that's why it's referred to as a bull market. Uh, you see bull markets during strong economic times. That is because companies' profits are typically rising, unemployment is falling, and hopefully wages are rising as well. And it kind of all trickles down, hopefully, you know, and then that results in everyone doing well and companies doing well, people spending more money, and then just share prices going up over time. Uh, quick thought here, guys. GDP, which is referred to as gross domestic product, is growing, which is an indicator of the overall size of an economy looking at their total goods and services. So if you ever hear the word GDP being thrown around, just think of that as the total value of the goods and services that a company provides. So if that's growing, typically that's a sign that we are in a bull market. That being said, here's a drawing of one. We've had a pretty wild bull market run here with just a quick blip here during the pandemic, but all of these highlighted areas are examples of bull markets that we saw. So we had one that started in the late 90s. We had one in the early 2000s after the housing market crash. That was the longest of history. And then we had this quick black swan event here, and now we're back up to, again, kind of the same trajectory we, trajectory we were prior, which is uh, pretty wild how quick the markets came back. Anyway, now let's talk about bear markets. A bear market is when share prices are falling, most investors are selling, or they're just out of the market entirely. Bearish investors make money from falling stock prices, similar to how a bear would attack with their claw. So if you hear somebody saying, I'm bullish on that stock, that means they want and think it's gonna go up. If they're bearish on that stock, they want it to go down or they expect it to go down and they're making money from that stock price going down, typically through something called a short sale, but we'll cover more about that later. Do we get into short selling? Uh, yeah. Briefly, okay. 
So we typically see a bear market happen during poor economic times or again, like a weird major life event here like we saw with this pandemic that was just something nobody saw coming. Uh, company profits will be falling, unemployment will be rising and wages will be flat or falling. Uh, the primary triggers of a bear market are investor sentiment and economic cycles. What I mean by that is the general emotion that investors have is typically what can trigger a bear market because bear markets happen when there's a lot more selling than there is buying. So if investor sentiment shifts towards that of fear and people are afraid of holding stocks and they want to get out of them, that alone is enough to often trigger a bear market or at the very least a correction. Also, federal interest rates and tax rates can result in economic expansion or contraction. You've probably heard of something called the federal funds rate. This is the rate at which the Federal Reserve loans money to banks. And by adjusting that rate, they can actually basically stimulate or pump the brakes on the overall economy. However, we have lowered that as low as possible, uh, where interest rates are lower than they've ever been for this long of a period of time in history. So we don't really have much of a safety net anymore. But in the past, we used to see higher interest rates, and then that rate would change based on the overall economic conditions as a means of controlling the overall economy. So as you can see here, the bear markets are times when, like we said, share prices are falling. We saw one around 2001, 2007, and this one right here was a quick one, so it was kind of hard to highlight, but we did actually have a short bear market uh, in 2020 based on that global pandemic. So the next thing I want to explain in a bit more detail here is something called investor sentiment, which is pretty much the overall feeling of the market because as much as people like to complicate the stock market and make it about all of these different things, to tell you the truth, the stock market is all about emotion. And it's pretty much a visual representation of the emotions of fear and greed playing out before your eyes. Fear indicates that a bear market may happen soon, or it may not at all, but that's just a time when people are fearful of the valuations of stocks, and they would rather have cash than have money in stocks. They would feel safer in cash, which is certainty. Um, a sell-off can often turn expectations into a reality. So that's kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around, but oftentimes the mere thought of a market crash, if enough people are worried about it, could actually trigger one based on people actually deciding to sell their shares and unload. Um, just if enough people are fearful and do that, that can often be the outcome and the reality. So here's some truth here about the stock market that I wanna hit you with that you may not be ready for, but as a beginner, I want you to be understanding of these things so that way you have realistic expectations with what the stock market can and can't likely do for you. So most beginners often expect unrealistic returns from the stock market period. They want to make 15, 20, 25% returns year after year. They wanna be a day trader or a swing trader. This is how most people, including myself, enter the market. And most people are just not successful with strategies like that. And if you're expecting consistent 15, 20, 25% returns for many years going forward, that's just not really a realistic goal to have with the stock market. But as a result, because people are looking for outsized or unrealistic returns, Many make the mistake of speculating, such as betting on a penny stock, looking for like a 100% return in the short term. So one of my favorite quotes here is from Warren Buffett. It says, the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. So what he's saying there, in my opinion, is that the stock market is a long-term game here, and those who make short-term trades are simply transferring money to those patient long-term investors. Also, guys, investing is 100% a marathon, not a sprint, so don't treat it like a sprint. Short-term investing... Um, and speculating is largely relying on luck, which is not a sustainable or repeatable strategy. And also, based on the emotions of fear and greed, most investors out there 
buy and sell at exactly the wrong time based on these emotional triggers. So now I wanna cover something called market cap or market capitalization. This is simply the total value of a publicly traded company based on the price per share. So the best way to explain this is to simply understand where the formula for market cap comes from and you simply take outstanding shares or the total number of shares out there multiplied by a set price per share which is whatever the current market quote is for that share that's going to give you the current instantaneous market cap or value of that company so market cap is used to determine the overall size of a company based on that perceived market value uh, which is set by the overall feelings of emotion and of, of fear and greed that these individuals who own shares actually have. Those emotions play out every single day, prices fluctuate, and so all throughout the day, the market cap of these publicly traded companies fluctuates too. So even though the business of Apple might not change on a given day, it's entirely possible to see the value of that company fluctuate billions of dollars with nothing actually happening just based on investor sentiment surrounding that stock and the overall market. So that being said, stocks are broken up into five main categories based on market capitalization. And I, I have a couple of examples here just so you guys can reference what these companies are. So first of all, you have micro cap, which is companies worth under $300 million. One example here being Sally Beauty. Uh, small cap companies have a value of 300 million to 3 billion. For example, we have AMC, uh, you know, a popular stock people have been looking at with these uh, Reddit users, you know, discussing these stocks and all the frenzy surrounding them. A mid cap stock ranges from three to 15 billion. Um, Penn National Gaming is an example of this. Large cap ranges from anywhere from 15 to like 100 billion. That would be a company like Twitter. And mega cap is like 100 billion dollars plus. That's like Alphabet, which is the parent company of Google. Now, there are no set rules on what is considered micro, small, mid, etc., but um, this is just a generally accepted guideline that I was taught and that I found myself. But some people may disagree and say, oh, under 5 billion is small cap, and there's no reason to split hairs. Just understand that smaller companies are usually worth a couple hundred million or a few billion versus something like Google, which is multi hundred billion, if not a trillion dollar company at this point in time. So typically that's a good way of when you're looking at a stock, understand, are you looking at a micro cap, small cap, large cap, you know, what type of valuation are we looking at on this company in terms of what does everyone think the company is worth? And later on, we're going to talk about how to tell if a company is overvalued or undervalued. It has very little, if anything, to do with the market capitalization. So don't right off the bat just think that Alphabet is way more expensive than Twitter. It may just be a larger company that commands a higher valuation. So now let's cover some of the characteristics of stocks that fall in these categories, okay? Micro cap is typically the smallest and riskiest stocks on the market that are gonna have the most fluctuations. Small cap companies tend to have a little bit less of that movement, still a lot, but often have huge growth potential, but there's still a ton of risk there because they're smaller, less proven companies. Mid cap stocks, you often get a blend of safety of the larger companies, as well as some of the growth potential of small companies. So mid cap is an area I actually like quite a bit in terms of looking for some growth and some stability. And then large cap stocks, lower risk stocks for those looking for appreciation and dividends. Almost all of my money is in large cap blue chip dividend payers. I'll explain what that means later. Um, but for one of my thoughts here, guys, uh, in my opinion, most investors should avoid micro cap stocks, maybe even small caps and be cautious understanding there's a much higher degree of risk involved and you're just more likely to see those drastic price fluctuations, which as a beginner, that's kind of the opposite of what you want to see when you get started. Next up here, let's cover the PE or price to earnings ratio. 
Well, the P.E. ratio measures the current market price per share relative to the earnings per share that a company has. The best way I like to explain it is how much you are paying for $1 of exposure to company earnings. So, for example, if a company had a P.E. of 30, that means that you're paying a value of $30 for $1 of that company's earnings potential. Uh, and so that PE ratio is a good metric for understanding if a company is over or undervalued based on the market and based on competitors. Uh, easy calculation here, you take the market value per share divided by earnings per share, and that's gonna give you the price to earnings ratio. The PE ratio is a comparison tool. It is not a one size you know, fits all thing where you just have to check this and it's gonna tell you there's a lot to valuing stocks, but the PE ratio is a good tool to utilize among others. Uh, it's typically used to compare stocks within the same sector or area of business. Uh, and that's just based on you know levels of normality that you see within different sectors or industries. For example, um, utility stocks often trade at a lower PE uh, where tech stocks trade at a higher PE. So if you were comparing the PE of a tech stock to the PE of a utility stock, it's not gonna be a very helpful comparison. But if you compared the PE ratio of two utility stocks, it's gonna be a much more useful comparison tool. So a high PE can indicate the stock is overvalued, usually too if it's higher than the industry or the peers. And a low PE can indicate the stock is undervalued, but like I said, it's not a one size fits all or a one stop shop. Um, because a company that is not generating earnings often has no P.E. ratio or a negative P.E. So it's not useful at all for looking at companies that don't have earnings or that are not profitable because um, it's just not going to be a helpful metric. Also, a company could have a low P.E., but if earnings are also going down, that means that as the share price is going lower, that P.E. is actually staying the same. So that's referred to as a falling knife, something we're going to talk about later. But just understand that we recognize what the P.E. is. We look at it as a comparison tool, but it's not a one-stop shop. And low P.E. does not always and rarely does it mean that something is a screaming buy. So just to give you a few examples here of some companies and their corresponding P.E. ratios, Apple has a P.E. ratio of 36.49. Microsoft is 38.49. So if you compare those two, you know, that's pretty similar, but Apple is actually looking like a little bit of a better deal right now than Microsoft. And I own both in my dividend portfolio. IBM, on the other hand, has a PE ratio of 19.39. Obviously a company I also own myself too, but one that people are not nearly as excited about or involved in a different business, you know, for the most part. Um, although IBM does a lot of cloud computing, that's what Microsoft and Apple do. So I have a lot of IBM in my portfolio and I'm hoping that's one of these stocks that, you know, over the next five or 10 years can get up there with the likes of Microsoft and Apple. Uh, and then Hewlett Packard, I don't even know what that company is doing anymore, but they're coming in at a PE of 13.73. So investing $36.49 in Apple stock will expose you to $1 of Apple earnings as of February 16th, 2021, which is when we made this slide here. So that's the best way to look at a PE ratio. And essentially what that means is if you were buying Microsoft, you're paying basically $38.50 for a dollar of earnings. But if you buy Apple, you're only paying $36.50, so it's slightly cheaper. So that's kind of how I like to use the P.E. ratio is comparing stocks within the same sector or industry that are doing a similar business operation. Next up, let's talk about volume. Volume is how many shares of a particular stock were traded that day. Uh, and then we also have another term called liquidity, which is the degree of ease associated with exchanging that asset for cash. So high volume stocks, stocks that trade on a high volume, which is typically any of those listed stocks on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, they have a high degree of liquidity because it's pretty easy to exchange your shares for cash and you have a good idea what you're going to get back for it based on the quoted price. 
um, you will have, uh, if there's low trading volume, you're going to have poor liquidity because it's not nearly as easy to transfer that money into, uh, you know, cash out of that stock. Um, my thoughts on this, as far as using volume as an indicator, look for volume in excess of the normal trading range. So that's one of the things I like to do is if I'm looking at a stock, um, I'll take a peek at their average trading volume. And if you see a day where volume is way higher, either in the red or in the green, you know, it's just an interesting indicator that tells you there's more people trading this stock today than we typically see on an average trading day. So volume is just how many shares of these stocks trade hands each day during the market hours. And also we do cover this later, but um, market hours are basically 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The market's closed on holidays um, and some random holidays too. The market is closed for like uh, President's Day and random ones like that sometimes. Um, so that's when you can trade shares. Some brokers offer pre-market or extended hours trading, but most people exchange their shares during that 9.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. EST window. So just for an example here, looking at a volume chart, we're looking at Penn National Gaming. And at the bottom, that chart is actually showing us trading volume. And you can see where you might be able to use this as an indicator if you were looking to, you know, do a little bit of, technical analysis or looking at the charts of this stock. So we highlighted some sections here and drew some arrows. You can see where higher than usual trading volume often resulted in an upward move of the stock. However, it's not the most useful indicator out there because typically when you see the move in the volume, the price has already moved. And so the, there's not usually a great way to like jump in on a stock. But if you are keeping track of volume and you see, you know, purchasing volume or green volume, you know, going up day after day, it might be a positive sign in the long run for that stock. So now we'll talk about my favorite subject of the stock market, which is dividends. I am a dividend investor myself. That's where almost all of my stock uh, portfolio is dividend stocks. So let's cover what that is here. And I'm, I'm not going to go into an insane amount of detail here because I actually have a full 52 minute step by step video about dividend investing. I'm going to put a card up in the corner. So we're going to breeze through it here and cover a lot of important details. But if you want more information, I would highly recommend that video as a supplement for this, you know, after you know, you go through the whole thing here. So that that's available if you need it. Dividends are regular cash payments made to the holder of a given stock. Not all stocks pay dividends. It's up to the company to decide whether or not they want to. Many large or mega cap stocks pay dividends to shareholders and investors looking for dividends uh, from payment, uh, dividend payments from stocks are often called income investors. Dividend stocks are often large, well-established companies. They're large or mega cap typically. So there's not usually as much risk associated with these stocks as there is with some of these smaller growth stocks. So that's kind of why I like dividend investing. It's uh, easy. It's pretty passive. I don't have to worry about the stocks I own. I own, you know, titans of America and the world in terms of these companies that have been around forever. So that's why I like having my money in dividend stocks. So as a lower risk investment, they sometimes offer a lower return. But um, the only thing I am going to say is you can do a style, which I do, of dividend growth investing, where you invest in companies that have both income potential and growth potential. So you get uh, the best of both worlds. Income investors can be paid in two different ways. Number one, asset appreciation or buying low and selling the share price for a higher price later, or regular cash payments in the form of dividends. So those dividends are often reinvested into buying more shares. That allows you to earn compound interest, which we'll talk about soon. Um, but I also like dividends because they can kind of hedge against a loss. So let's say, for example, you bought shares of a, a company with a 5% dividend yield and maybe that, sh that share price went down 10%, right? 
Well, through that next year, you're going to get 5% back in dividends that are potentially going to go back into shares of that company, meaning you're kind of slowly bailing yourself out with those dividends. So that's another reason I like them. They're kind of a cool hedge against a loss. And even if you own a company where the, the share price is down, it's still nice to get those dividend payments and know that you're still getting something for your money. So just to show you an example of how stocks can pay you in two different ways, here we have Procter & Gamble, okay? It's another stock I own in my dividend portfolio. And so let's say you bought shares on January 3rd, 2020, when they were trading for $122.58 per share. Well, on January 4th, 2021, roughly one year later, they're trading at $137.82. So your return there, if you were to sell this share or however many shares you own there, um, you know, you would have a 12.4% return owning Procter & Gamble for one year. But on top of that, while you owned that stock, you also earned dividends. And in 2020, they paid a dividend of 316 per share. It was actually paid quarterly at 79 cents per quarter. So the yield on that stock is actually 2.5%, which is pretty attractive. That's why I own Procter & Gamble. So let's say for this one year period, you owned 500 shares of Procter & Gamble. Well, you would have earned $7,620 of appreciation from buying low and selling high. But since that company also paid dividends, you earned another 1580 in dividends. So you would have made a total of $9,200. This is why I like stocks that can pay me in two different ways. That's why I love dividend stocks. So now let's cover a bit about risk and reward, which is probably not something that you want to talk about, but it's one of the most important foundational pieces of investing. Because every investor out there has a different level of risk tolerance. And risk tolerance is essentially how you react to losing money. Uh, and you should just start thinking about that in your own life. Like, how do you react when you go to the casino with $100 and you leave with nothing? Do you care? Do you get emotional? Do you cry? Like, that same emotion that you feel... At the uh, uh, you know the casino, if you lose money, it's going to be a similar feeling if you lose money with stocks. Some people are great with risk and they don't really care if they lose money. Other people are very conservative and, if, and the thought of losing money stresses them to their core. And so it's important to be honest with yourself when determining this risk tolerance. And age plays a large factor in the investor's risk tolerance because a young person could have a very aggressive risk tolerance as they are decades from retirement. So if they make bad financial decisions when they're younger, they still have many decades ahead to undo those decisions and hopefully make money from other investments. Whereas a person five years from retirement would have a very low risk tolerance as they will be drawing from their investments in the near future. This older person needs the money in the next five years, whereas a younger person is probably not going to need that money for like 40, 50 years. They can afford to take on more risk and give their money a long time to trend upward. So one of my thoughts here, don't confuse investing with your desire to gamble. Uh, one of the great lessons from Benjamin Graham's The Intelligent Investor, remember that a 50% loss requires a 100% gain. Uh, kind of a funny statistic there. So if you buy something and it, does, it goes down 50%, you need a 100% return just to get back where you started, which again, something to consider before you put a lot of money into some of these speculative or risky gambles. So just to show you an example here of a high risk stock that paid off. And to be clear, I'm not saying that Tesla is a gamble. Um, at this price, you got to make your own judgment on that. I, I would personally say it's a little bit uh, insane, the valuation. But I don't own shares of Tesla. But to those who do, you know, I, I like the company. I don't really have too much against them. But, you know, the, the price is the only thing to me. So I'm not saying this is a gamble. It might be now, but... This was a high risk, high return potential stock. And you can see over the last year, it's up an incredible 375%. It went from 170 per share up to 800 bucks, which is unbelievable. However, high risk can also be bad. Here's a high risk stock that went bad. It's called Next Cure. I don't even know what this company was, to be honest with you, but 
in one year, it went down 70.4%. So you would need more than a 100% return at this point on this stock just to get back where you started, almost looking like a 3x or, or a return potentially just to get back to that, you know, $50 per share. So high risk is fun when it works in your favor. When it works against you, it's horrible. So just understand that if you are taking risks, this will play out as a reality at some point in time. It's inevitable that you're going to put a bunch of money in a stock and it's going to drop like this and it may just be a learning experience for you. Alrighty guys, so it's another day here. We got some new energy for this video. Unfortunately, I did have a bit of an injury yesterday, so I'll be wearing a uh, cast of some sort on my hand. Nothing cool, didn't get into a fist fight or anything like that, guys. Just a injury to the hand, so just wanted to mention it and... So that's what's going on here, but everything is totally fine. Um, the show must go on, that being said, guys. So let's jump right back into it by talking about a very important document called the Earnings Report, which is one of the biggest distinctions out there between a publicly traded company and a private company. Because private companies are not required to disclose their earnings and revenue in certain documents like that, Whereas once a company becomes public, they are required to do this quarterly earnings report where they're sharing financial documents and updates with investors. So public companies file a quarterly earnings report and quarterly earnings are used by investors to determine the overall financial health of a company. But not only that, it also helps you to track the overall health of the company too. Because as important as it is to do your due diligence at the beginning when you invest, you also want to make sure that you're keeping up with these companies you're investing in to make sure that their overall situation is not changing. And one of the best ways to do that is by looking at these quarterly earnings reports or they also have an annual report in most cases, which may be even more of a uh, synopsis that would be less to go through. Uh, Long-term investors tend to spend a lot of time reading earnings reports uh, to be familiar with their investments in the companies that they're investing in. Also, analysts make estimated guesses on the quarterly results of a company, and they will also issue um, what they call recommendations, whether it be a buy, hold, or sell. Now, I personally don't pay very much attention at all to uh, what these analysts are saying about a stock. I tend to just make my own decisions um, based on my own research, but especially as a beginner, it's something to at least keep an eye on is the overall analyst recommendations surrounding a stock. But you have these analysts who make an educated guess about how they expect a company to perform, typically looking at metrics like revenue or earnings per share or things like that. And then if you see a company beat those expectations, the share price usually goes higher unless it's already priced in, but we'll talk about that later. Or if the uh, earnings fall below expectations, typically we'll see a move lower as a result. But the stock market is totally erratic and emotional at times. And I've seen times when a company has stellar earnings and the stock still drops, maybe because all that was already priced in. So up next here on this, guys, we are looking at uh, Palantir stock here, just for an example of what can happen when a company has earnings that disappoint shareholders. So I'm not familiar with this stock. I don't actually own it. Um, I had my assistant here put it in the slide for an example, but Palantir had quarter one earnings and you can see they came out. And this stock went from, you know, 31.80 per share down to 28.38, down 11%. But even if you look at the five day move here, you know, this stock went from 38 per share down to 28. So especially with a stock that is a tech related stock, I believe this is a cybersecurity company, you're going to expect to see more wild and drastic moves. But it's just important to understand that the earnings report can certainly have an effect like this on a given stock. And then just to show you an example of positive earnings, we know that Twitter 
posted quarter one earnings that were positive. A lot of social media companies have been doing really well during the pandemic um, as people are looking for things to do. And on the day they posted earnings, the stock went from 59.87 up to 67.77. So it jumped up over 13%. And if you look at the one month chart here, you know, Twitter is doing exceptional here. They've gone from about $47 a share up to around 75. So um, stocks like this can have really quick moves, but earnings reports certainly do have a major effect on companies that you invest in. So the next thing I want to talk about here is another important stock market principle. And we've kind of alluded to this already in our discussions about the emotions of fear and greed controlling the stock market. But instead of using the word fear, I want to instead introduce the word supply. And instead of using the word greed, we're going to use the word demand because it's essentially the same factors at play here, but we can use these words interchangeably. The price of anything out there is determined by the market supply and the market demand. I'm sure we're all familiar with this where, you know, there's been things before that we're trying to buy that we have a hard time buying and then maybe the price goes higher because it's a highly sought after item. Like for example, um, right now the NFTs are very popular. So let's talk about NBA Top Shot. The only reason the price for those things is as high as it is, is because of the market demand and the market supply. The demand far outweighs the supply in this case, and that is why those prices have gone higher and higher. However, you can easily hit a tipping point at any point where the demand drops and the supply hits the market, and that's when you can have that sell-off. So the emotions of fear and greed are sort of the precursors to supply and demand. Uh, supply is going to be from fear. That's when a supply hits the market because people are fearful of something and they don't want it anymore. Whereas demand is greed. People want as much of it as they can get. They don't care what it costs. They just want this asset. That is demand. So supply is the amount of a commodity, product, or service available to the market for purchasing, whereas demand is the desire of the buyers for this product or good or service. High demand and low quantity or supply is going to create this emotion or it comes from this emotion of greed and that's going to drive the price up. Low demand and high supply is going to result in fear and this is going to lower the price or fear can trigger low demand and high supply. They sort of work interchangeably here, but these are the emotions that we have at play controlling the stock market day in and day out. And the advantage here is that since we're always seeing these fluctuations, while it is difficult to unearth hidden value in the market, if not impossible with how efficient the market is today, it's entirely possible to strategically time your investments. And maybe if you decide you're looking to add some shares of Apple to your portfolio, for example, maybe you decide to do it on a day when there's a lot of fear in the market where the NASDAQ is selling off and maybe you're getting you know, a slightly better price you know, by purchasing on that day. So even if you don't plan on doing any short-term moves, you can look at the overall market sentiment and you can also kind of time things and try to do your purchasing on like a red day in the market, for example. So right here, guys, I wanna show you a visual representation of this supply and demand looking at Tesla stock. So back in January, we saw the share price run up to around, it looks like $900 per share, and then it sold off down to about 800. That is because collectively during that period of time, more investors were selling than there were investors buying. There was too much supply hitting the market and not enough demand to purchase it. However, at a certain point when the stock starts selling off, more and more people are interested in buying it. And then we get to this point where when it hit around 800 per share, enough buyers stepped up to the plate and said, we're gonna buy now, right? They got greedy rather than fearful 
enough people started buying, it changed the sentiment surrounding the stock, and it went back up almost to where it was prior. So you're always gonna see supply and demand or fear and greed impacting individual stocks as well as entire sectors or industries and entire markets. So the next thing I wanna talk about here is something that nobody likes to discuss, and that is the concept of inflation. So there's a lot of talk about this right now based on all the money printing that happened in 2020. So inflation is like a buzzword right now. We're certainly seeing it with certain uh, you know, goods and services or things that we're looking to purchase. For example, construction material and lumber is really expensive right now, and a lot of people are saying this is a bad sign for hyperinflation. While I don't think that is the case, it is simply something that, you know, is being discussed more now and something to be aware of as an investor. We're not going to spend a ton of time here, but just to cover this here, inflation is less purchasing power of the dollar over time. Uh, the simplest way to explain this is imagine the cost of, you know, popcorn at the movie theaters in 1930 versus 1970 versus 2010 versus today. We would all probably expect that price to go up as it did. And so essentially what this means is you're getting the same amount of popcorn, but it's costing you more money because the buying power of each dollar goes down every single year. So the main purpose of investing, your goal number one should be to simply outpace inflation to protect the buying power of your money. Because at the end of the day, savers are losers. While I do have an emergency fund and I recommend having some liquid savings, um, you know, you can't save all of your money in the bank or you're going to lose the buying power and you're not going to be growing um, or protecting your buying power. It's going to be going down over time. So inflation is the enemy here. We want to avoid that. You do want to have some cash for emergencies. But other than that, I try to keep myself pretty heavily invested. That way I know I'm at least outpacing inflation, if not, you know, growing the buying power of my money through gains through investment. That's pretty simple to understand there, guys. Next up, we're going to talk briefly about saving money in a bank account, okay? So most people simply save money in a bank account. Very few people out there actually invest. It's, it's pretty sad. Having an emergency fund is very important, um, but I want to explain to you how even though you, know, you are saving and earning some amount of interest, you're still losing money, sadly. Uh, since 2000, the average rate of inflation has been 2.2% per year. Meanwhile, the average interest rate on a bank account is around 0.05%. So even though you are earning some amount of money in interest, the amount you're losing based on inflation or the lessening of the buying power of your money far exceeds that level of interest that you're earning. So the net loss here is actually a loss of 2.15% per year. So if you had a hundred grand, that's like, you know, roughly $2,000 of buying power that you would lose over the course of one year based on the current rate of inflation that we've seen in the modern era. Alrighty guys, so now that we have a lot of the uh, foundational stuff out of the way, I wanna start talking about some of the nitty gritty here. And the first thing we're gonna discuss is how to actually purchase a stock. Because it's not like going out there and buying a new pair of shoes or something like that where you just go to a store and say, hey, this is what I want. It's a little bit different because you're utilizing something called a stock broker. So the first step to investing in the stock market outside of you know taking care of your debts paying off high interest credit card debt and setting aside an emergency fund which i'm assuming everyone has done that if you followed any you know finance videos in the past um that's always the first step but beyond that your first step to actually invest in the market is choosing a brokerage now i actually am part owner of a personal finance blog called investingsimple.com. I'm going to link up to it down in the description below. That's what we do over there is we do apples to apples comparisons of all of the top investing apps and try to help people understand in the simplest way possible, you know, what avenues they may want to choose based on their investing goals. Just like this video here has been hopefully very simple and easy to understand. That's also how we write our content. So um, you're more than welcome to check that out, investingsimple.com, uh, or you can put it right in your browser and bookmark it for later. But we have a lot of helpful resources over there in terms of choosing your brokerage. Also, guys, like I said, I am going to put that 
Link down below with all of the current best free stock promotions. If you've enjoyed this video so far and you've gotten value out of it and you feel like using one of my affiliate links, I may earn a commission if you click on that link and use any of those links on the page. However, as I said earlier, that is never expected but always appreciated if you want to you know, give back to me just by clicking on a link. But there's going to be no upsell, no ask at the end of this video, guys. I'm just here to, you know, give you five, six years of information all packed up here in, in, a, in a neat little resource that I hope will help people to accelerate their wealth through the stock market. So anyway, brokers facilitate buying and selling of securities. And you need to go through a stock broker in order to transact on the stock market. So it's similar to a car dealership, whereas if you wanted to buy a Ford, you go to a Ford dealer. Uh, your stock broker is like a stock dealer. So it's like going to the Ford dealer. You wouldn't just call Ford and order a truck. Um, however, th that might not be the case in 10, 15 years because more and more we're shifting to that, um, getting rid of middlemen and dealerships and just saving money. So as it stands now, we still go to a dealership to buy a Ford F-150, but that may change down the road. Not to mention, the broker also provides you with a very important thing, which is a trading platform, which is a user interface that allows you to direct the brokerage to place those trades on your behalf and actually execute orders. Now, the good news is, if you are new to the investing realm here, you've picked a really good time because, you know, as, as far back or, or as recent as five years ago, rather, we used to have to pay commissions to these brokers. Uh, when I started investing, I did so with a Scott Trade account and I was paying six or seven dollars per trade and this was just normal, right? Now, there are dozens of free stock trading apps out there um, and some of them appeal to more beginners while some are for more advanced traders. There's literally so many options out there, guys. Um, definitely many to choose from. Like I said, I'm going to have an updated list down below of the best promotions. I'm going to check it every month and make sure that it's current. That way, you know, you're getting the best possible free stock promotions. And because all of these companies are competing with each other, there's a lot of venture capital and investment flowing into this fintech space. So a lot of them are offering free stocks or free bonuses. Uh, so it's really a good time to take advantage of this if you want to use some of these free solutions. However, that being said, most if not all of them have no storefront locations or you know direct or manual account management, not to mention the customer service is pretty lousy. Uh, so you know my recommendation is always if you want a really good brokerage, you know you can't go wrong with something like Charles Schwab. I'm not affiliated with them. However, what you may find with a brokerage like Schwab is they offer so much that it's complicated to get up and running. Whereas these newer commission-free apps, uh, Schwab is commission-free too, but some of these newer apps spend more money and time on user interface and user experience, and they're just way easier and they're just way easier to use. Um, and also another thing you should be aware of is that many of these brokerages um, earn money through PFOF, payment for order flow, um, and they also offer margin accounts and other features like paid memberships. So they're not operating a charity, they're operating a real business, they have revenue streams to make money, uh, they just decide to make money in other ways rather than just charging commissions to customers. So it's a really cool time to be investing. Um, there's a ton of different ones out there. And uh, like I said, if you want to compare them, would recommend highlyinvestingsimple.com. Or if you want to take a look at the promotions, that's going to be down below. And just to keep an eye on, you know, what type of free stock offerings and things like that are available. Uh, now we'll talk about account types, okay? And for beginners, this is where I would recommend, and this is a cash account. Um, this is where securities are always paid in full. And remember, securities is just a fancy word for stocks. What this means is that any money you have in your account is money you've deposited. You're not borrowing any money. And when you buy stocks, they're paid in full. You know, you're not borrowing any money. Uh, cash accounts do not have strict credit requirements because investments are paid in full and no margin is extended. 
Here are the typical requirements for opening up a cash account. First of all, proof of identity. They're also going to ask you for your employer, social security number, address, etc. because this is a taxable asset here and your investment activity is 100% reported to the IRS. So we'll talk more about taxes later, but that's why they verify employment, get your social, etc just so they have all of their ducks in the row uh, with what they have to do in terms of regulatory agencies. Also, make sure when you're opening the account, you specify what type of account you are looking to open. Um, we're going to talk about margin accounts now, probably something that you don't want. I don't use margin, um, but some people I've heard of have accidentally opened up a margin account not knowing what it is. Margin accounts allow you to borrow money against the investments in your account and then use that money to buy more stocks. So with a cash account, if you invested $100 in a given stock, it's because you had $100 to put into that stock. Whereas with a margin account, you might only have, let's say $50, but the um, brokerage might give you another $50 to borrow using your other stock as collateral. So yeah, I'm sure you can understand how this gets dangerous. You're essentially magnifying losses potentially and gains, but magnifying losses is more so what I want to leave you with as a message here. Uh, you're charged interest um, based on the line of credit. Every brokerage has their own rates. This allows you to increase leverage on a stock, which simply means you have control of more shares. And it also will allow you to short sell if you do want to bet against a stock. I do not short sell. Um, the only thing I would recommend is a put option instead of doing a short. Um, I've never short, shorted a stock. I don't think I ever will. I've never even bought a put, but that's the only way I would ever try to bet against a stock is through a put option, not shorting, because uh, there's the potential there for infinite loss, which we'll discuss later. Um, margin is typically capped at 50%, which would mean that if you had 100 grand in your margin account, that would give you about 200 grand of leveraged buying power. However, for every dollar that you use above 100K, you're going to pay interest monthly. So it can be very dangerous, 10 out of 10 would not recommend for a beginner. And honestly, most people should not use margin. I don't use margin, not recommended, but it's important to understand what it is. That way you don't end up with a margin account by accident. So now we're going to cover some of the basic order types associated with placing trades in the stock market. So in order to buy or sell a stock on the market, you need to execute something called a market order and each brokerage is going to offer different order types. Now you'll find most of the same order types across all the major brokerages. Um, and to be honest with you guys, I mostly just use market orders, which we'll explain in a minute. So if this looks confusing, don't worry and understand that the majority of people are just going to do a market order. And this is probably information that you don't need to know, but if you are curious, you know, stick around for this little section here. Some trading platforms offer sophisticated order types that may interest advanced traders. However, one of my thoughts here, most beginners only need the basic order types and familiarizing yourself with market order types is crucial to your success. Um, just to understand what's available out there. Because the thing is, I've heard of this happening a lot where people are placing a order for a stock or they're trying to place an order and they're trying to get something to happen and they get a different outcome. So they screw up an order and they end up buying when they think they're selling or vice versa. So I know it sounds stupid, but like it happens all the time where maybe you go to sell a stock and you accidentally doubled your position because you're not paying attention to your orders. So let's cover that now. And, and I definitely recommend just understanding these order types so you're familiar if you're you know looking to place an order first of all we have market order like i said this is what i use 99 percent of the time if not all the time for the most part with a market order you can place this order during market hours only as we said that's 9 30 a.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time closed on holidays um, and that's monday through friday during a market order you're buying or selling a stock at the current market price, whatever the price is at that instant point in time. And that is going to be based on something called the bid and the ask price. 
Now, I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds here with this, guys, but the bid and the ask price, this ties in with the level of liquidity of a stock. If you're trading listed stocks on the major exchanges, which in the U.S. here is New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, there's enough people actively trading shares that you typically know about what you're going to pay uh, or what you're going to sell for when you're transacting. However, with more thinly traded stocks on like, um, you know, pink sheets or things like that or over-the-counter exchanges, you can get a much wider spread, which is the difference between the bid price and the ask. Um, it's kind of like on uh, in an actual like auction environment where you have maybe an ask for what someone's looking to sell for and then people bidding on it. Um, with less desirable exchanges, there could be a huge difference. Like maybe someone's asking a dollar ninety, but the bid is a dollar forty. So if you're looking to sell or buy, it's going to be at any price between a dollar forty and a dollar ninety, which is a wicked spread. Um, whereas with a listed stock, you might only have a spread of a couple fractions of a penny. Um, again, that's another advantage of just sticking to listed stocks, ensuring that you have the liquidity if you do in fact you know need to transact and you know you know you, you're going to be aware of prior what uh, roughly what you're going to pay or what you're going to receive for those shares so market orders are used when orders are to be filled immediately during market hours uh, when it's open and your order will be placed at the best available price but may fluctuate from the price that you see based on that bid and the ask price referred to as the spread so now we'll talk about a limit order briefly. That's pretty much, if I'm not using a market order, it's a limit order, and I don't use pretty much any of the other order types. A limit order is an order to buy or sell a specified number of shares at a specified price. So for example, a limit buy order could mean that you're buying at a price below the current market price or a sell could be above the current market price. So with a limit buy, you could say, hey, the stock is $1.85. I want to buy at $1.80. So if it reaches that price, it's going to execute the order. Whereas a limit sell would mean, okay, the stock's at $1.85. You might have a limit sell that says if it hits $1.90, unload all of my shares. But if it doesn't hit those prices, the order does not execute. Also, Limit orders can be issued in two different ways. There's trading day only, which would be only this current trading day, or there's a GTC order, which is good till canceled. So let's say, for example, you owned a stock. This is where people sometimes will use a limit order. Let's say you have a stock that you own and you have a price target in mind of, hey, this is what I'd be willing to sell it for. So you could do a, a GTC, good till canceled, limit order and just have it hanging out there. And then if that price ever climbs to your target price, the order will execute and maybe you have a limit order in place to you know, take some, if not all profits off the table. I personally don't do that. I don't really use limit orders, um, but some people do that as sort of a way to um, automatically take money off the table and get some of their emotions out of play here with the market. So guys, there are more order types out there, but to be honest with you, I don't want to waste your time. Uh, there's a stop limit and a stop loss order, and a lot of brokerages offer that, but I don't use them personally, and I don't want to waste your time with something I don't use. So now we're going to move on to another important topic. Again, one that people don't like to talk about, but it's good to understand, and that is something called fund settlement. So stock trades settle three business days following the trade date. Meanwhile, options trades settle in one business day. Your brokerage oftentimes allows you to reinvest unsettled funds on a good faith agreement that you will hold the securities until the fund settlement date. Because truth be told, if you sell a stock, even if that cash enters your account, which it will instantaneously, the funds are not settled. It takes three business days for the fund to for the funds to settle and the trade to settle. So during that time period, you can't withdraw the money yet, but a lot of brokerages allow you to reinvest it in other stocks, understanding that you will not sell that other position before those funds settle. Uh, kind of confusing, guys, but like let's say for example, you sold a stock that you had a profit on on a Monday. And then you took those proceeds on Monday and bought another stock, right? The funds from those 
from the stock that you sold on Monday is not going to settle until Thursday, which would be three business days following. So if you bought new shares of a different company and sold it before Thursday, this is something called a free ride and you can get in trouble with your brokerage because you technically made money using borrowed money, something that uh, the SEC is not a fan of or FINRA, I can't remember which regulatory agency, but either way, brokerages are on the lookout for this. It's called a free ride. They give it to you as a courtesy, but if you abuse the privilege, it is taken away from you. Um, and there, you can also end up with a suspension for a period of time if you have multiple free rides. So never, ever, ever swing trade with unsettled funds because you might get stuck holding a position simply because your funds are not settled. Um, and this is also important to understand here too. Um, a lot of brokerages allow you to use something called instant deposit now. And essentially it's something similar. When you move money from your bank account to your brokerage through the ACH clearinghouse, um, through the ACH process, um, it does take two to three business days, if not longer, to get your funds in there. So rather than having to wait for your money to arrive, a lot of these newer brokerages will front you the money up to like $1,000. That way you can invest immediately and your funds come in later. So that's another convenient feature of a lot of those newer apps um, and I, I will say this, I'm not aware of, of Schwab or the big brokerages offering this, but a lot of the apps that offer the free stocks, et cetera, do have this instant deposit feature. That way you don't have to wait for the money to hit your account before you're able to invest. Alrighty guys, so we covered a lot of the boring stuff there, fund settlement, order types, et cetera. Now I wanna start discussing different assets that you're able to purchase through the stock market because a lot of people are under this misconception that the stock market is just a place to buy and sell stocks. However, there are different types of assets out there that trade on these major exchanges outside of the realms of, uh, of stocks. And even within stocks, there's many different categories of stocks. So we're just gonna get a bit more granular here and cover some more information. So stocks in general, I typically will break them down into three different categories. You have blue chip stocks, which are well-established companies, oftentimes dividend payers. That's where majority of my money is. Then you have growth stocks, which are newer companies that have more growth potential. And then you also have a hybrid of the two, which would be a blue chip growth stock or a dividend growth stock. Um, and then you have more speculative and penny stocks. Now, within each of these categories, you know, based on market cap or market value, you have a different risk profile. Um, but if you were to break these down into three categories, that's about how I'd separate these out. And for beginners, I would say, you know, and this is not financial advice, but just based on my own experience, blue chip stocks is a great place to start for beginners. You're very unlikely to get burned there and maybe a little bit into growth, maybe some blue chip growth, but speculative penny stocks, that is not beginner territory and not something I recommend. Um, you should understand what category a stock falls into before investing in it. And that's going to be based on doing your own due diligence, looking at the market cap, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a lot of stuff that's going to come further on in this video. So first of all, let's talk about blue chip stocks. Blue chips are stocks of well-established, financially stable, and well-managed companies. Uh, it's companies with decades, if not centuries, of records and operating history. They've been through all kinds of different economic conditions. Um, there are larger companies that may not be growing as fast, but they're less volatile and more consistent than newer startup and growth stocks. Most of them pay dividends to shareholders, <clears throat> which is great because that gives you the opportunity to reinvest those dividends, allowing you to earn compound interest. So that's why I love blue chips. They're also a great option for beginners to consider because you're very unlikely to get burned or you know to lose all of your money purchasing a blue chip company. And we'll go over some examples of them too, just so you guys have some tangible examples. Growth stocks, on the other hand, are stocks of companies that are increasing in value rapidly. Earnings are expected to grow at a faster rate than the market or industry average. They're more recently formed companies and they're not time tested like the blue chip peers. 
They're typically significantly more volatile than blue chip stocks. And in terms of that PE or price to earnings ratio, which we said earlier is essentially how much money you're paying per exposure of $1 of that company's earnings, you typically see the PE ratio be much higher in a growth stock versus a blue chip stock because of the anticipated growth. Now there's another metric I like called the forward PE ratio that projects forward into the future based on earnings estimates and tells you what that PE is likely to come in at in the future if the company hits those revenue and earnings targets. And then for the final category, we have our penny stocks. Uh, in my opinion, there's no business of these being in your investing portfolio. Uh, speculative investments are a form of gambling. I'm not saying to avoid them entirely, but put them in a separate portfolio based on the teachings here of that book right there, The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. So I have my main portfolio where I have my blue chip dividend payers. Then I have my play money portfolio, which is a much smaller amount of money. And that's where I do my speculations. And that's where I play around. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't play around with the market, but any money that goes into your speculative account, you should be willing to lose 100% of that money. So you don't put your rent money in there. You don't put your inheritance in there. This is just play money. Treat it as if you were going to the casino and playing roulette. That's pretty much the equivalent of speculating in the market. It's high risk, it's volatile, and oftentimes it's heavily manipulated, especially if you're trading stocks off the major exchanges. And one of my thoughts right here, guys, as, as I said earlier, while I do not discourage speculating, I think this should be done in a separate trading account specifically designed for speculating or, or earmarked for speculating. Again, that's not my original idea that came from Benjamin Graham, but it's something I follow myself that I highly recommend to you. So now let's take a look at a couple of fun examples here of some wild moves in the stock uh, stock market and some things that a lot of beginners got caught up in that probably burned them pretty good here. Nokia stock went on a Reddit fueled rally earlier in January and it closed at a high of 655 per share on Wednesday, January 27th. Well, one day later, that stock closed at 469. So people potentially lost about 28% in one day. That is the danger of speculation. Again, if you were buying into Nokia stock, a lot of people were doing it based on the hype or the rumor, and they were buying it simply because they expected it to go higher in the future, which should not be your main reason for purchasing a stock. So this is what speculation can look like. Next example we have here. Oh, we go to mutual funds. Okay. So the next asset type I want to cover outside of stocks is another popular one. And this is a mutual fund. Mutual funds involve active money management, which essentially means rather than having you pick and choose what you're investing in, you have somebody else that you pay to make those decisions on your behalf. Because of this, active money management is significantly more expensive than passive. Uh, most retail investors cannot afford professional management of their money. Uh, hedge funds are the popular investment for you know millionaires and billionaires, but you often have to have you know a multi-million dollar net worth just to utilize these services. So the alternative here is the mutual fund. Um, this allows small investors to collectively pool their money and have it managed for them. And this was the most common investment during the 80s and 90s. And then in the 90s, the ETF was born. And that was kind of a game changer. Because prior to that, the main option that you had for getting the broad market exposure was through a mutual fund, which meant you're paying this guy or this office full of men and women to manage your money. Um, and you're basically saying, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. I want you to do it for me. But then in the 90s, another product came out called the ETF, the exchange traded fund, which basically said, hey, Maybe we don't want to pay all of these people over here to manage the money, but we don't want to do it ourselves. What if instead of actively managing it, we just did it passively and instead we just 
low, you know, owned the market in a very low fee manner. That was the birth of the ETF. And now mutual funds are really not popular at all anymore. Not something I invest in, not something I really discuss on my channel. Um, and it's something that I, honestly, in the next 20, 30 years, I wouldn't be surprised if it's something that's fairly uncommon uh, in terms of what people are actually purchasing. It reminds me of how a lot of people would purchase, you know, treasuries and savings bonds for kids, you know, and it's not really something you see so much anymore these days. So basically, mutual funds are for active money management. They're not really popular anymore. And personally, I, I don't recommend mutual funds because if you look at the statistics, most of them are actually not outperforming the market when you consider the amount you're paying in fees. So we've talked about this quite a bit already, but a bit more detail here about the ETF or exchange traded fund. So mutual funds and ETFs are very similar in that they allow you to own a basket of many different stocks. However, the key distinction between the two is that the mutual fund is actively managed, which contributes to higher investment fees, whereas the ETF is passively managed, meaning there's little to no human involvement, making it significantly less expensive. So many people decide to simply own a piece of the broad market rather than trying to pick and choose individual stocks. And statistically speaking, those who simply passively own the market tend to outperform those who pick stocks. I'm not saying this to discourage you from, you know, doing it yourself. You see me doing it every day, being active with my investments. I do it because I enjoy it. And it's kind of a social aspect for me as well, being an active stock trader. However, if you're just looking to passively build wealth, ETFs are going to be one of the best options that you have available to you uh, today. So the next thing on my list here is not technically a separate asset. It's a separate account type, but I included it here anyway just to discuss. And that is the IRA or Individual Retirement Account. So a lot of people are familiar with the 401k, which is the employer sponsored retirement savings plan. But outside of the 401k, you can also open something called an IRA and have additional money that you're setting aside, be it tax deferred or, or um, you pay taxes or potentially no taxes based on the type of account. Um, so there are benefits to IRAs, especially if you're young and you have many years ahead of you to allow that money to grow. Um, if you're investing for the long term, especially for retirement, you should definitely consider maximizing contributions to, at the very least, the Roth IRA, which for most people is the best retirement account option you have um, available to you outside of your 401k from your employer. Also, most people should do both. It's not really like one or the other. Most people should, you know, utilize the 401k, especially if there's some type of employer match being offered. And then you should also consider when possible contributing, if not maxing out contributions to that Roth IRA retirement account. Um, anyone with earned income can contribute to an IRA. Some people open them up for their children, and there's kind of interesting loopholes with the tax system associated with the IRA. So there's two main types of IRAs for retail investors. That is the traditional IRA and the Roth IRA. So first of all, let's discuss the traditional IRA. A traditional IRA has a yearly tax deductible contribution limit that changes over time. Basically, over time, these limits are going up uh, based on inflation. So because buying power is less, people are allowed to stash away more for retirement. So anyway, in 2021, the limit is $6,000 or $7,000 if you are 50 and up. Keep in mind that money is growing in an IRA tax deferred, which means taxes are paid when you draw the money out at retirement age, which for most people is 59 and a half. So every retirement account out there except for the Roth IRA has something called an RMD or required minimum distribution, which unfortunately means that at 59 and a half, you have to start drawing from that account. Whereas the Roth IRA, you can keep contributing and there's no required minimum distribution, meaning that let's say you work till 70, you know, you're still able to contribute to that Roth IRA. Whereas with the traditional IRA, even if you were still working, once you hit that 
golden age of 59 and a half, you're required to start taking distributions from the account. So another clear distinction and characteristic you should be aware of between the two. So now briefly discussing the Roth IRA. With the Roth IRA, you do not get any type of tax deduction. Um, you're using your post-tax money. However, the benefit here is that your money is then going to grow tax-free assuming that you follow the guidelines and you start drawing past the age of 59 and a half. Again, you don't have to start drawing at that point, but if you pull money out before then, you may be subject to penalties and taxes, which can be pretty hefty. So money invested in a Roth IRA has already been taxed, so it grows tax-free. And once you reach the age of 59 and a half, you can withdraw the money tax-free, but you don't have to. You can also keep contributing if you want to. Early withdrawal penalties apply, and IRAs typically involve mutual funds, but there's a lot of good options these days for self-directed IRAs where you can actually pick and choose the investments. So it doesn't have to be a boring mutual fund investment. If you wanted to, you could put your IRA in Tesla or Amazon stock if you chose to with that self-directed IRA. That being said, guys, um, when you put money into a retirement account, you should expect to leave it there until retirement age. So don't direct money into a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA or a 401k if you don't plan on leaving it there for a long time. There are a few exceptions. For example, uh, you can use some retirement money towards the purchase of your first home or certain things like that. And also one benefit to the Roth IRA is you can withdraw contributions at any time. You just can't touch the earnings. So if you put six grand in a Roth IRA and then two years later it was worth 7,000, you can pull out your $6,000 contribution tax-free, penalty-free. But if you touch that $1,000 of earnings, now you have to pay taxes and penalties on top of that. So just be clear about that and make sure before you put money into a retirement account, you're able to commit to that term of leaving that money in there until retirement age. So we talked about this a little bit, but we'll briefly cover here 401k plans. Um, money is set aside from each paycheck and contributed towards the retirement fund. Unfortunately, with 401ks, you're typically locked in with whoever the company you work for chooses. Some 401k plans are better than others, unfortunately. So hopefully you get a good one if it's like Vanguard or Fidelity or one of those big names. But there's also a lot of good resources out there that help you understand whether or not you have a good or bad retirement plan. So it's also good to do a quick Google search and just see, you know, what people have to say about the fees and the investment choices with your 401k provider, which your employer chooses. Uh, some employers offer a match up to a certain percentage. You should always take advantage of that. It's free money if they're offering that. A 401k is not self-directed, so be selective about what mutual fund or ETF your money is allocated into. Unfortunately, you're stuck with whatever options that provider has, and sometimes they're just really lousy depending on the provider. Contribution limits apply to a 401k plan of $19,000. $500 per year. So now that we're past retirement accounts, which is not technically a different asset, but I lumped it in here anyway, now we'll talk about other assets you can trade through the stock market exchanges, one of the most popular being a REIT or Real Estate Investment Trust. Um, this is a pool of real estate investments. Essentially, you generate revenue through leasing, renting, and selling those properties, and they often generate hefty dividends as 90% um, of the total net income or more is required to be passed along to the shareholders in order to classify this asset as a REIT. I personally don't invest in REITs because I prefer to have um, direct real estate exposure through my actual properties that I own. So I have a house hack in New York and I have my primary residence now in Florida. So I have, you know, uh, at least a quarter million dollars of equity in real estate between those two properties and over a million in terms of the market value. Um, I don't own the whole properties, but over time, you know, I do want to get those mortgages paid down in the next couple of years. So 
I like that type of real estate exposure. So with my um, brokerage account, I stick to stocks. I don't touch bonds. And I also have a little bit of money in crowdfunded real estate. So personally, I don't invest in REITs. But if you don't currently have any real estate exposure, this may be something that you consider as part of your portfolio. Alrighty guys, so the only other asset really to speak of is bonds, which we already talked about. You can also trade MLPs, Master Limited Partnerships on stock exchanges. I personally don't own any bonds, I don't trade them, and I also have never owned or traded MLPs. So I'm just simply not going to cover them, uh, but they are available if you wanna do more research about that, but most people don't invest in those types of assets. Now, we're gonna talk more about different investing strategies um, to give you an idea of the different ways that people are trying to capitalize on this thing known as the stock market and of course we're gonna start off with the day traders so day traders trade in and out of stocks during a trading day and end each day in cash with no open positions day traders are using sophisticated high frequency trading platforms to capitalize or to take advantage of very fast very short trends in the market they're solely trading based on technical stock analysis, which essentially means looking at the charts, be it a line chart or a candlestick chart, which we'll talk more about later. Day traders do not study the fundamentals of a company. They don't care about it because it's not relevant to the current price swings during that day. It's all about the emotion. Day traders solely care about the emotion of a stock, the the. Uh, indications of fear and greed showing up in the price movement of that stock, that is what they're looking to capitalize on. They don't read earnings reports. They don't do any of that. They look at charts, they look for certain patterns, and they trade the patterns they're familiar with. The idea here for day traders uh, who are successful is to take many small profits each day that add up to a large profit over time. For example, some day traders aim to have a 1% profit every day because that would lead up to a lot or that would add up to a lot over a long period of time. The number one problem with day trading and trading in general is that all human beings for the most part are susceptible to this emotion known as greed, which is going to cause you to oftentimes stay in a position longer, not sell. And the most common reason that people are not successful with day trading is they frequently will get greedy and ride a winner into a loser. So just an important thing to understand here. Day trading is not for most people. The majority are not successful. I've never tried it. I've tried swing trading, which we're gonna cover shortly. But that's what day trading is, just so you have a general idea. So after day trading, which is the shortest possible time horizon where you end every day in cash, the next from that in terms of duration is swing trading, which is where my stock market journey started um, back in 2015 and 2016. This is how I started. I, I wanted to be a trader. I wanted to make 20, 30% returns per year, and I didn't. It didn't work out for me, but I ended up becoming a long-term investor. And so it worked out in the long run, but I feel like, again, a lot of people start off in the stock market looking to generate crazy returns and they want to find penny stocks and do all this stuff but as they mature and learn more about the markets and how these things function they realize okay no more of a long-term strategy is what works for most people alleviates stress and and that's kind of the intended use case for the stock market so swing trading or short-term trading is typically a two to five day hold on a position the big difference between swing versus day trading is that swing traders hold positions overnight, whereas a, two a true day trader ends every day in cash. The goal here is to identify a trend and capture the gains by following the trend in the short term. Swing traders are following the overall prevailing trend of the market, and swing traders rely mostly on technical stock analysis to identify trends within a price movement and they're typically looking at something called a candlestick chart. So after that, after swing trading and after day trading, there's like intermediate term, uh, like short to medium term trading. I kind of, you know, made this up myself here. I don't even know if there is an intermediate term, but there is also a type of investing where 
You're not day trading and you're not holding it for two or five year, uh, two or five days, but you're also not holding on to it for two years. And I'm calling this intermediate term trading. This is typically a term of six to 12 months. An intermediate term investor is someone who invests in a stock with the intentions of selling it maybe in the next year. Now, one of the most important things to consider when buying and selling stocks is the tax implications associated with that move. And so me personally, being in that highest bracket with federal income tax, um, I always aim to have those long-term capital gains and qualify dividends just to avoid paying those taxes. Uh, I pay as little as possible as a result. So we're going to talk more about taxes later, but for now, understand that an intermediate term trader is typically like six to 12 months or around one year. And, and there's a big benefit to owning a stock for one year or longer associated with the taxes um, that you're going to pay with that investment that we'll discuss later on. Next up after that, we have the long-term investors. A long-term investment is an investment made with the intention of holding it for like one year to maybe five years, you know, a couple year investment. Long-term investors have a significant tax advantage over short-term investors and traders, which we are going to discuss later. Long-term investors are not concerned about market corrections, seasonality, or other economic factors for the most part. Historically, long-term investing has been the winning strategy for most investors, especially those who do it passively. That is individuals who get into ETFs um, and they buy things consistently over time, regularly contribute to the market, and they leave their money in there for many decades to grow. That's basically the intended use case of the stock market. And um, ironically, what they have found looking at successful trading accounts is that some of the most successful accounts out there are ones where the recipient or the beneficiary um, of the account had passed away or forgotten that they even had the account. So activity is typically the enemy and uh, something that's going to um, uh, eliminate some of your gains. Typically, the more active you are, um, the less money you're making. You're just generating a frenzy of activity that's kind of spinning your tires in the mud. So historically, long-term investing has been, you know, the winning strategy for most people. But then we have a different style here, which is that Warren Buffett type long-term, which is super long-term investing. That's like the Warren Buffett strategy where some of the stocks in his portfolio He's literally owned them for like 40, 50 plus years. So when Warren Buffett buys into stocks, he's thinking out many decades ahead in most cases. Some of his investments are just super long term. Um, I'm not sure. There's certainly some companies I'm going to hold for 10, 20 years like Apple, for example, or something like Intel. Um big companies like that. I'm sure there's going to be some companies I own for 10, 20 years, but for the most part, I would classify myself as like an intermediate term to a long-term investor where the majority of my money is in these blue chip dividend paying stocks looking to capitalize on some upside with the stock, but mostly dividends being reinvested. However, I also will make occasional changes to the portfolio here and there based on, you know, shorter term moves, be it sector rotation, which we'll discuss later or something like that. Alrighty guys. So now that we covered the different terms that people invest for, be it a short term versus a super long term investor. Now we're going to talk more specifics about some of the different strategies that different investors utilize, starting off with value investing, which is pretty much the strategy of Warren Buffett slash Benjamin Graham, which is looking to purchase uh, companies trading below their true intrinsic value. So people like Warren Buffett, you know, this worked a lot better for them way back in the 70s and 80s when there was more value to be had in the market. Now it's just more efficient and it's hard to find hidden value, but it's still a strategy that is worth mentioning here. Essentially, a value investor picks a stock based on the value of the underlying company and the assets. Um, they understand the difference between the price and the value of the stock. So they're looking to purchase a stock 
whereas the actual value in terms of the assets is higher than the actual price per share. So they're just looking for value that other people are not seeing. A value investor compares the current price of ownership to the value of ownership in the actual company. So it's essentially looking for hidden gems in the market where other investors have you know, not found this opportunity. Easier said than done, almost impossible to do this in 2021, but still a strategy worth discussing. So that is value investing. Next up, we have growth investing, which is much more popular in this day and age. The main goal of growth investing is to grow your money. It's focused around assets that tend to appreciate in value. So people tend to invest in stocks for capital appreciation, which is where you're looking to buy low and sell for a higher price down the road. Um, a straight up growth investor is only looking for growth of the share price. They don't buy dividend stocks. They just want to buy low and sell high. Young people are at an advantage when it comes to growth investing because they have a lot of time ahead of them and they can afford to be more patient. Growth investors typically focus on the five-year outlook of a given company. So to compare growth versus income, and um, just so you guys know, you can do a blend of both here. I actually do um, what's called dividend growth investing. But anyway, most people are typically either on the growth side of the fence or the income side of the fence. Um, whereas, although some people are in the middle, but growth investors are looking for earnings to be reinvested in the company, resulting in appreciation of the stock price. So growth investors want companies to retain profits themselves, reinvest that money into other business operations, which should result in more earnings and a higher share price. Whereas income investors are looking for regular cash payments from their investments rather than the company themselves reinvesting earnings themselves. So that's the typical school of thought there. And then, you know, dividend growth investors, um, those people are looking for both. They want a little bit of growth potential and a little bit of income on the side. And, and that's basically the school of thought that I fall into um, where most of the stocks in my dividend portfolio are dividend payers, but they still have some growth potential. For example, uh, Microsoft, Apple, um, Intel are a couple of the names. I also have Logitech and Texas Instruments. These are all companies that pay dividends, but still have some level of growth potential. Now, when it comes to growth investing, in my opinion, the number one thing to look for is a strong company in a growing industry. I would not recommend investing in the weakest links out there because if you think of an industry as a chain, you know, you don't want to invest in the weakest link of that chain. In my opinion, you'd want to invest in one of the stronger leading companies in that chain. To determine if an industry is growing, you compare it to a benchmark, and what people utilize for this is typically the S&P 500. This is simply the overall performance of the 500 largest publicly traded companies in the United States, and it gives you a benchmark of how the overall market is performing. So if you hear people referring to the market or the market performance, nine times out of 10, what they're talking about is the S&P 500. So one of the first things you tend to do as a growth investor is you look for a industry that's experiencing above average growth outpacing the S&P 500. From that point, you then look for the leaders of that industry. And then maybe at that point, you take a look at some of those PE ratios or different indicators to compare these companies side by side before ultimately making an investment decision. That's pretty much the overall process that I go through. For example, earlier this year, I got bullish on financials because they were sold off massively. So I said, financials are way in the red. I think this is gonna go up in the short term. So I did some research and I decided on Bank of America stock and I experienced like a 60, 70% return in that stock in like six months time. Not gonna happen every time. That was really good timing on my part. Uh, and a lot of luck, um, but there was some strategy involved, but that's basically what I do. I kind of start with the industry, and then I look at the companies, and I look for the stronger links of that chain, but making sure I'm not buying a company that's, you know, the most overvalued in that given 
uh, area of the you know business that sector. So here we're looking at one of my favorite tools out there. It's completely free. It's called the Fidelity Sectors and Industries Tool. Highly recommend it, guys. Check out that website yourself and bookmark it because this is typically where I start my search if I'm looking to add a new stock to my overall portfolio. I look for an industry that's underperforming and then I look for a strong leader in that industry. So for example, over the last year, airlines have massively underperformed the S&P 500. So as we can see here, the blue chart on top, the light blue is the S&P 500. The dark blue is the airlines. Now, I actually got bullish on airlines back in March, and I did exceptionally well with them. I traded an ETF called Jets, which basically owns a little piece of all the major airlines. So I got bullish on uh, airlines and I actually did well here. I pretty much sold around this run up here. I sold on that initial run up here of jets. Um, but just for an example here, this is what it looks like when an industry or sector is underperforming the S and P 500 here. It was following it and then it underperformed it. And even now I think there's still opportunity with airlines if you, you know, are comfortable with the risks associated with this industry. However, even at this video right now, as of making this video, we're still seeing that airlines are still underperforming that S&P 500. But if we go to a longer view here, which is actually a 10-year chart, we can see surprisingly that from 2014 to around 2020, airlines were actually outperforming or doing better than the S&P 500. So in my opinion, guys, and again, this is not financial advice, but my opinion is that once all of the tailwinds of the pandemic are behind us, airlines should go back to meeting, if not outperforming the S&P 500, because that was the trend prior. So this is just one of my favorite tools for looking at the overall snapshot of how is the whole market doing compared to individual areas of the economy. So let's say, for example, you decide that you want to invest in a certain industry. You maybe use that Fidelity Sectors and Industries tool, and you saw that a couple of sectors were like red hot, meaning they're way up and totally outperforming the S&P 500. I tend to avoid those if possible, and I look for potentially whatever anybody else is not focusing on. So when everyone was focusing on tech, I decided to focus on financials. Now everyone's focused on financials and I actually got back into tech. So I tend to just go against the prevailing trend and I follow pretty much something called sector rotation. So you're going to find that certain sectors or areas of the economy heat up for a while and then they sell off. But that money sells off and goes somewhere else because uh, this is just you know, billionaires shuffling money around. It comes out of one and it goes somewhere else. So I'm always trying to think about, okay, if money leaves tech, where is it going to go instead? That's why I, you know, got that position in Bank of America and that ended up panning out for me and it was a positive investment for me. So anyways, let's say you found an industry and now you're wondering what companies are there out there? Well, to find companies within a certain industry, one of the best approaches is to find a major index tracking this industry. So for example, there's the New York Stock Exchange ARCA airline index or Jets is probably the more popular one now. I don't even know if Jets actually existed um, when I originally made this uh, presentation years ago. So we updated it to make it current, but it's kind of interesting. I think the Jets ETF has actually come into existence between this timeline here. But anyway, what you're looking for is the components of the index. What individual companies are part of this index? And then you're going to look at those companies, do some research, and from there, look for you know a strong company in a growing industry. Or it's an industry that was doing well prior, and now it's just not doing well. Like airlines were doing well for like six, seven years, and then they weren't. And so... They should do well again, assuming, you know, you know, we have a safe reopening and everything goes well. So th that's what I tend to look for. Now, beyond just the fundamentals, looking at, you know, the P.E. ratio or the forward P.E. or things like that, there's a lot more to consider before making any investment. For example, does the company have a strong and recognizable brand? 
Does the company have a high barrier to entry or could someone else easily disrupt them? Does the company have intellectual property or patents that protect them? I actually just recorded like a one plus hour video Big shocker, I bet, because I never record long videos. But anyway, I just did this long video called How I Pick My Stocks. I'm going to put a card up in the corner for you guys. Um, it's another one you might want to revisit. What we're talking about right here, guys, this goes through step-by-step step the criteria I look for when I actually pick a stock to invest in. Right now, we're doing a high-level overview of the stock market as a whole, but if you want to dive more specifically into given topics, um, I have plenty of video resources for that. So I've got two cards there already, the one for my dividend investing, all about dividend investing if that's the strategy you want to go with. And then I also have how to pick stocks if you're curious the actual criteria. I'll give you some basics in this video, but we certainly go into a lot more detail over there. Now, if you're looking to generate income from your stock investments, you'll need to look at stocks that pay dividends because unfortunately, if you own a growth stock or a stock where you're looking to make money by buying low and selling high, you can't make any money owning the stock unless you sell it. You have to sell it for more than you paid and that's how you make money. One of my favorite parts about dividend investing is that these stocks pay you while you own them. You don't have to sell any shares to make money. All you do is own those shares, and as long as you hold on to them, you will get your dividends, assuming that company continues paying them. So when looking for dividends, you will want to look at the dividend yield of the company, which is essentially the amount being paid out in dividends each year expressed as a percentage. One of the biggest mistakes out there for beginners is chasing a high dividend yield. It's often a trap. Dividends are never guaranteed. They can be changed, cut, restructured at any point in time. Like I said, check out that dividend investing video for more information on this. We literally spend about one hour just talking about dividend investing. Now, one important thing to understand if you decide to be an income investor is called a DRIP or Dividend Reinvestment Plan. As an income investor, you're going to need to decide what you're going to do with your dividends. Pretty much you have two choices. You can take your money and run and maybe you go buy a sandwich or something. But the problem is, you know, then your money's just kind of thrown away and it's probably not moving into a different asset moving into a liability or just a general expense. The other option is to reinvest that dividend either back into the issuing stock or across your entire portfolio. That is what I follow as a strategy. All of the dividends earned are reinvested across my entire portfolio. And with the brokerage I use, it actually rebalances that portfolio in the process. So as those um, allocations skew based on varying performance in the stock market, the dividends that are earned are actually helping to balance me back out and return me closely as possible to the target allocations. Uh, this allows you to earn compound interest or dividends on dividends. You earn a dividend, it goes back into the stock, and then that dividend earns dividends, and then that dividend earns dividends. So you can see how this compounds over time. And essentially a drip is a feature that automatically allows you to reinvest those dividends either across your portfolio or back into the issuing stock. So something you may want to consider when comparing features and benefits of different brokerages. Now, another important thing to consider when investing in dividend stocks is looking at the dividend history. You want to be able to answer these questions. Number one, how long has the company been paying dividends? I typically like to invest in dividend aristocrats, which are companies that have been not only paying, but also growing the dividend every year consecutively for 25 years or more. There's only about 60 companies on this list. They're highly sought after, and a lot of them are in my portfolio because these are the types of companies that I personally like to invest in. Another question, what is the dividend growth streak? How many years have they been growing dividends? Has the dividend ever been interrupted or suspended? Also, 
Does the company have a durable competitive advantage? These are all questions I like to ask myself and have answers to before adding a position to my dividend portfolio. Now, the next strategy I wanna discuss here is one of the most brilliant investment strategies out there. It takes all of the guesswork out of the equation. It's free and it's easy, but not a lot of people like to follow it, and it's dollar cost averaging. It's virtually impossible to successfully time the market. And even if you do it once, the odds of doing it over and over again, it's just highly unlikely. If you're not interested in studying the technical charts and determining optimal entry points through technical stock analysis, or just simply maybe buying on days that are more red or when there's blood in the streets, this investing strategy may be for you. DCA or dollar cost averaging is the technique of buying a fixed dollar amount of a security on a regular schedule regardless of the share price. Historically, this has proven to be a great strategy as over time you just simply pay the market average. So at times when the share price is up high, you're buying less shares, but if it's down low, you're buying more. So over time, you're paying the average of the market. Dollar cost averaging, as long as you're buying good quality assets, you really can't go wrong here. Um, I actually right now have a stock I'm doing this myself with. I'm actually putting like uh, $250 a day into one of these stocks that I'm excited about trying to build up a long-term position. Um, I'll probably do a video on that separately because I want to specifically talk about that stock later on. But dollar cost averaging is a strategy that I use myself and it's certainly helped me with my investing career. Alrighty guys, so now we're gonna talk briefly here about technical stock analysis or studying the charts of a stock. This is where my stock market career or you know stock market life started was back in 2015, 2016, when I was learning about swing trading, thinking I was gonna be you know this big trader. Obviously, it didn't pan out that way. I eventually shifted into a more long-term strategy, but I still do utilize technical stock analysis when looking for optimal entry points for stocks. So analysis of a stock using charts that displays price and volume patterns is the definition of technical analysis. The goal here is to identify entry and exit points through predictive price movements and trends. So day traders and short-term traders rely solely, in most cases, on technical stock analysis when making decisions about buying and selling stocks. Longer-term traders and investors may find this information to be useful as well as it can help you to determine optimal entry points. And we're going to cover some really basic stuff just with price charts that you should be familiar with, even if you don't plan on ever looking at a candlestick chart in your life. So now I wanna talk about a few different charts you should be familiar with in the stock market. The most common one is a line chart. This is gonna show the closing price of a security over a set period of time. Line charts are great for comparing a stock to another stock or an index and essentially benchmarking it to a competitor or the industry as a whole or the S&P 500. Then we have bar charts. This is a single vertical bar that shows the opening and closing prices, which can be useful to kind of show you like how the stock traded that given day up or down. Also, you'll have bar charts at the bottom that typically show you trading volume, which we talked about earlier. That's how many people are exchanging that stock on a given day. Candlestick charts are the basis of technical stock analysis, and it essentially incorporates line charts and a bar chart, whereas a body and shadow are added. And this may sound crazy, guys, but we're going to go over an example right now. And even if you don't understand this, don't worry about this, guys. You don't need to understand candlestick charts in order to invest, but I'm going to give you a quick understanding right here. A white or green body, so this one right here or this one right here, represents a closing price higher than the opening price. So that means that in this case here, the stock opened here and then it closed up here. And for the green chart, it opened down here and it closed up here. Now a black body, on the other hand, represents a closing price lower than the opening price, but higher than the closing price of the previous day. So for example, on this black 
chart on the left, it means it opened up here and closed down here. And the same thing with the red chart, it means it opened up high here and closed all the way down here. So that pretty much shows you um, based on the color of the body, whether it's white or black or red or green, depending on the software you're using, and there's free sites for this, I'll show you one, that shows you if the stock closed higher or lower than the open. And the actual uh, sh shadow shows you how high or low the range was for where it traded. So sounds confusing, but now let's just jump right into an example here, okay? Here... Alrighty guys, so here we are looking at a candlestick chart for Apple stock. I got this from stockcharts.com. It's completely free and I would definitely recommend taking a peek at it if this is interesting to you. Um, there's a lot going on here guys and there is another type of body here, the solid black one. That's a little bit outside of the scope of this beginner's video. Um, but for the most part, we're focusing on the red bodies and the open bodies for indicators of the stock moving up or moving down. Now, there's all kinds of different names for the different patterns that show up here, like the um, ascending triangle, descending triangle, the doji, different things like that. I don't remember any of them anymore because I don't really utilize technical analysis that much. But I do pay attention on the overall trend of a stock if I'm adding a sizable amount to my portfolio. Also on this chart here, you can also see trading volume at the bottom and black bars are bullish volume and red bars are bearish volume. And you can kind of see where, like let's say for example, you're watching this stock for a while, right? And you see that it just had a really red day here where it sold off massively. You know, this probably would have been a good area to pick up some shares. And obviously a couple of months later, the stock continued to trend upward. So that is why I like using a little bit of technical analysis um, and, and that's kind of the general picture it can paint for you. Also on this day here, when the stock actually gapped much higher, you see that it was on very strong uh, bullish trading volume, which is a good indicator of a strong, uh, strong momentum behind a stock. So candlestick chart patterns can be used to predict price movements. It's not 100% accurate, but especially if you understand the personality of a given stock and you've seen that pattern play out before, that's when it's more and more useful. Both bearish and bullish chart patterns exist. We're not going to get into any chart patterns here in this video. Candlestick chart patterns are an entire field of study on their own. Um, and maybe someday I'll do a whole video just talking about technical stock analysis. A lot of people have written entire books about candlestick stick chart patterns but the main thing you want to know is understanding support and resistance areas which is what we're covering now so support and resistance areas are a result of the market supply and the market demand for a particular stock and as we said earlier supply and demand fear and greed it's all the same thing this scenario plays out based on the level of fear and the level of greed people have towards a certain stock so essentially what happens is you have this resistance area, which is where this first arrow is pointing. And this is like the ceiling for a stock. So it tends to trade to that ceiling and then towards that support. And it trades in that range until there is something to push it upward or downward. So in this case here, it was bouncing back and forth between support and resistance areas based on people being fearful or greedy about the stock and this back and forth tug of war. However, then in this particular instance, it broke out above the previous resistance and made a new high. What's cool about that is the old resistance often becomes the new support unless that support is broken. And that's the basics of support and resistance areas. It'll make more sense when we look at some examples of this playing out with actual stocks. So anyways, guys, that's the gist there of technical stock analysis. If you understand support and resistance areas, that's 90% of what you need to understand. Essentially, um, what you tend to have happen is that uh, stocks will stay in a period of what's called consolidation, which is where you're, they're just trading within that tight price window of support and resistance. And then eventually you're going to have a breakout above or it's going to collapse below that price and fall 
to a lower support. That's why it's so important to understand the prevailing trend behind a stock because if the trend is upward for the last five years, you know, what happened in the past is likely to continue going forward unless there's some major change. So that's why these days, anytime I'm buying into a stock, I want to make sure I have solid momentum behind it and I'm going with the grain of the market. I'm not going against the grain and buying into a stock that has a downward trend over the last couple of years. So if technical stock analysis is the personality of a stock or the emotion, fundamental stock analysis tells you about the overall health of a company. Fundamental stock analysis is the study of the financial health and fitness of a company. The main factors that you analyze looking at the fundamentals of a stock is the revenue as well as the earnings and the debt. Revenue is simply the total amount of money that that company has come in. And then the earnings is what they keep after they pay their employees and at different expenses. And then you have the debt, which is how much money that company owes to other people. The goal of fundamental analysis is to determine the intrinsic value of a stock. But it's also to understand if the company is in good financial health, adequate or poor financial health. Now there's also a whole other area of fundamental analysis which studies the management team of a company and this is something that I do consider when investing in stocks. Because at the end of the day, a ship is of no use without a good captain. So one factor you need to consider when analyzing a company is the management team of that company and whether or not that company is being run well. So the best place to start out with this is called the board of directors. This is a group of individuals elected to represent the shareholders and create management policies as well as decide on major company decisions. Now remember earlier we talked about how how certain companies offer voting shares. If you have voting rights as a shareholder, the shareholders with voting rights collectively elect these members. So if you own more shares, you have more of a say. If you own less shares, you have less of a say. So that's another reason why voting rights are important. And I know a lot of people don't make a priority about this or even mention it, but I always like to have a say behind decisions, uh, especially if my money's behind it. And I know a lot of people invest in stocks and they don't ever vote. And I'll be honest with you, I rarely have ever voted in any company decisions, but I just like the idea of knowing that I could if I chose to. And real quick, guys, I just wanted to show you this hierarchy here of a corporation, okay? At the very top, you have the shareholders. Their needs and priorities are typically met first because if the shareholders are happy, the share price is going up, the, you know, the whole, you know, CEO of the company, the management team's happy and it all trickles down. So at the very top, you have the shareholders. Below that level, you have board of directors, which is elected usually by those shareholders through some form of vote. And then below that, you have the president. And then that breaks off into different categories like a treasurer or a secretary. Then you have vice president roles, management, middle management, and then you have employees. Just a basic drawing. Uh, really, the only thing I want you to understand is the top two here, how the shareholders are really at the top. And then the board of directors is essentially helping these shareholders have a voice in the company. Now, in terms of doing fundamental research, one of the best places to start is the investor relations section of a publicly traded company's website. So for example, Apple has Apple investor relations. So if you're researching a company right now, or if you're already own shares of a company and you want to learn more about the company you own, you should type in the name of the company in Google followed by investor relations. And this is going to give you earnings reports, annual reports, uh, any SEC filings and different important documents like that. So that would be your first piece of homework after this video is pick one of your favorite stocks or a stock you're considering, put it into Google, blank investor relations, and then skim through that website and look at what information is available to you on this website geared towards investors in the company. So now what I want to cover here is sort of a Warren Buffett approach to fundamental analysis of a company. Now, this is not his exact strategy. Nobody knows that for sure, but a lot of people have studied the decisions that Buffett has made over the many decades he's been investing. And these would be common questions that Warren Buffett would ask 
before investing in a company. Number one above all else is the management truthful and straightforward with the shareholders. He's a big fan of honest management and he knows that if the board of directors and management is not honest, those problems are going to trickle down. Number two, is this a business I can understand and study? And if you're brand new to the stock market, you may choose to include some, if not all of these questions on your criteria as well. Simply put, especially as a beginner, you should not invest in things that you don't understand yourself clearly. Number three, is the operating history of this company consistent, making sure this is not some flash in the pan success. Number four, does the company have a long-term competitive advantage? Number five, is management treating shareholders fairly? For example, are they paying out dividends? Are they reinvesting earnings into things that are growing the value of the business? Or are they being greedy and retaining profits and not necessarily you know, investing money in the right places for shareholders? And then lastly, is this company a leader or is this company a follower? Very important questions that you may include in your own criteria when you begin researching the fundamentals of companies. So another piece in the fundamentals category is something called Goodwill. And as much as I love that store, uh, it's not what I'm talking about. I do love Goodwill though. But what we're talking about here is something different. This represents the premium paid for a company for those intangible assets outside of the tangible ones. So tangible assets are things you could put your hand on or things you can identify as real, uh, whereas the intangible assets are things that still have value, but they're not physical things that you can transact or, or you know look at. The best way to explain goodwill is in terms of an acquisition. If one company acquired another, the price paid above the book value would represent the goodwill of a company. And goodwill is solely based on the subjective value. So it's very much based on opinion because it's not a tangible thing. For example, Coca-Cola would have a lot of goodwill if a company was looking to acquire them. So a few examples of uh, items or intangible assets falling under goodwill could be the value of a brand of a company. So Coca-Cola, for example, has a very strong, recognizable, and valuable brand. And another thing could be uh, customer base. Not a, necessarily a tangible asset, but something that still has value nonetheless. Anything under that category falls into the goodwill of a company. So the next ratio I wanna talk about here is the price to earnings to growth ratio or the PEG ratio. Essentially what this does here is it takes that PE ratio and compares it to the anticipated five year growth of that company. Essentially this helps an investor determine the level of speculation or risk involved in an investment. So essentially, the way you calculate this is you take that current P-E ratio, which is essentially the earnings multiple or how much you're paying to expose yourself to just $1 of company earnings, and then you divide that by the projected earnings per share growth over the next five years, and this is gonna give you the price to earnings to growth ratio, and it allows you to kind of normalize that data based on the anticipated growth of that company. So PEG is not necessarily, again, something where it's an end-all, be-all, but it's another useful tool in the toolbox. So just for some tangible numbers here, a PEG of one means the PE ratio is justified based on the anticipated growth of that company. But keep in mind, anticipated growth doesn't always translate to reality. It's based on projections. A PEG below one means the stock is below the fair value based on the anticipated growth. Meanwhile, a PEG above one means the stock is above the fair value in terms of the anticipated growth potential. So sometimes you might come across a stock with a really high PE ratio, but you might find the PEG is a lot lower 
based on the anticipated growth of earnings over the next five years. So when I'm looking at stocks, I typically always look at that P.E. ratio and sometimes I'll delve into that PEG ratio too, just to paint a better picture for myself. So here's a real simple example of that PE and PEG ratio. Let's say I have an ice cream stand that nets a profit of $10,000 per year, and I decide I wanna sell this business for $1 million. Most people would say that's ridiculous, you're never gonna get that much money for that business. Based on that figure, it would take 100 years to recoup your investment at a $10,000 net profit per year. So the ice cream stand currently has an earnings multiple or P.E. ratio of 100. So if you invested in this ice cream stand, you're paying $100 today for $1 of annual earnings potential of that business. Most people would never spend that much on an ice cream stand, that's ridiculous. However, let's say this is a booming area and I expect to net $25,000 profit in the next 12 months. That would mean that the forward earnings multiple or the forward PE would only be a 40 based on that earnings growth expected. So that's how larger earnings tomorrow expected could mean that the PE is very high today, but as long as that company continues doing well, hopefully it all becomes justified based on those earnings coming up and everything normalizing. So the next thing I wanna talk about here is company assets. Examining a company's balance sheet is an important piece of fundamental analysis. And to be honest with you guys, this is pretty much the only key financial document that I'm looking at these days when doing any type of fundamental research on a company. It essentially lists out different assets and liabilities and gives you a general idea of the overall financial health of a company. It's similar to our own personal finances. If somebody has a lot of debt with low income, it's not looking very good. Whereas if somebody has minimal debt and high income and a lot of assets, they're in better shape financially. The same exact thing plays out with companies. Some of them are in excellent financial health and some of them are in total distress. So one of the first things I wanna talk about is assets versus liabilities. Assets are things that have value. Liabilities are things that take money out of your pocket. In the, in the words of Robert Kiyosaki there, they're things that cost you money or uh, you know they're a debt of some kind. Then we have current versus non-current um, assets. A current asset is uh, something that is either cash right now or assets that are expected to be converted to cash within the next 12 months. So current assets shows you how much cash this company should be able to get at in the next 12 months to pay for debts and other related expenses. Non-current assets are long-term assets that a company expects to hold on to for longer than one year. So they're still having, they still have value, but they're not gonna be converted into cash in the next 12 months. So just to break this into two categories here of current versus non-current assets a company may have, current assets could be cash, foreign currency, highly liquid investments, which oddly enough is uh, a lot of companies are putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet. That's another one. Accounts receivable and inventory. These are all things expected to be converted to cash in the next 12 months or less. Non-current assets still have value, but they're not going to be converted to cash. For example, property, any type of plants, equipment, the goodwill of a company, which we identified earlier, illiquid investments, acquisitions, and any of those intangible assets, which would mostly fall into that category of goodwill. They still have value. They still belong on the balance sheet, but these assets aren't readily convertible into cash and they're not expected to be in the next 12 months. Now, let's talk about liabilities. Liabilities are things that take money out of your pocket or their debts or money that is owed to a company. Basically, like assets, there are two types. There's both current and non-current liabilities. Current liabilities are debts due to creditors within the next year, and then non-current liabilities, aka long-term debt, is just debts that are going to come due in a term of greater than one year. 
So what I like to do is look at, you know, what does the company have in current assets compared to current liabilities? That tells me what is going to be due in the next 12 months and what's going to be cash or converted into cash in that same period. And will this be enough to cover any debts that have to be paid in that time period? So just to go over some examples here of current versus non-current or long-term debts, current debts or current liabilities, that's short-term debt, accounts payable, taxes payable, interest payable, declared dividends, and any maturing long-term debt that comes due. Non-current liabilities are any like long-term debt that a company may have, typically related, uh, related to bonds that are issued, uh, pension liabilities, deferred revenues, deferred taxes, and deferred liabilities. There's a lot of complicated accounting stuff that goes on with publicly traded companies. I don't understand the majority of it, but there's a lot of things that companies do to, you know, uh, defer earnings or defer taxes and different things like that. All of this is spelled out on the balance sheet. So since we covered a lot here in this section, I just want to cover a few key findings. And this is kind of the questions I ask myself when studying the fundamentals of a company. Number one, are total assets growing each year? It's kind of like seeing your individual net worth going up over time. You want to see the net worth or total assets of a company going up year after year. On top of that, you want to pay attention to liabilities. Are they also growing each year? And which one is growing faster? Ideally, you want to see assets growing faster than liabilities. Next is inventory growing or shrinking. Another good thing to keep an eye on. Does the company have enough cash to cover current liabilities? You want to make sure that the cash or assets readily convertible into cash is enough to cover any debts coming due in the next 12 months. It also helps you to understand what types of assets does the company own? Is it mostly current or non-current assets? Lastly, it's very important to understand is most of the debt short-term or long-term? Typically, I would rather see a company with less long-term debt and more short-term debt that's getting paid off. Long-term debt is a very negative quality in my book when looking at a long-term investment. Next, we're going to cover something called stockholders' equity. Stockholders' equity is essentially the net worth or what is left over when all liabilities are covered by the assets. Stockholders' equity should always be growing and you want to look for stockholders equity over the last five to 10 years. And if this is a growth stock, you're going to want to see consistent, hopefully double digit growth of stockholders equity over a multiple year time span. So beyond the balance sheet, there's also another document called the income statement. This is going to be reporting the revenues and expenses of a business, as well as what areas they are coming from. Essentially, the income statement gives you a bird's eye snapshot of everything going on with this formula, which is net income equals revenue minus expenses. It itemizes all of that, gives you an idea of the profitability of a company, and just shows you the revenue coming in, the expenses, and how that's translating over to profits. Alrighty guys, so we are on to day number three here. We're gonna go ahead and wrap this video up today. So we're back to talking about some of those key findings that I look for on the income statement. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the main document that I look at these days, if I'm doing any type of fundamental analysis of a company, is going to be that balance sheet. However, if you do wanna go a bit deeper here, this is kind of above and beyond the scope of a beginner video. But if you're looking at the income statement, these are a couple of the questions that I like to ask myself when analyzing a company. Number one, is the company increasing sales and increasing revenue? Because sometimes you'll see sales increasing and then that may not be translating to profits, et cetera. So you just wanna get an idea of all, are all of those numbers heading in the right direction? Number two is gross profit keeping up with total revenue because sometimes you'll find a company is growing revenue but sacrificing profitability in the meantime and their profitability is slipping. Number three, are we seeing double digit Revenue growth, if this is a growth stock, um, I would always like to see that double digit growth there over a couple of years looking at year over year revenue growth. 
Next up is cost of revenue growth reasonable. You don't want to see that accelerating faster than um, you know profitability. Otherwise, that means that they may be less profitable as they're bringing in more sales and revenue. Number six is an increase in revenue resulting in an increase in operating income. Number seven is the company maintaining profitability. So it's good to see that over many, many years, this company has continued to be profitable. And then number eight, are any of the expense items increasing at an abnormal rate based on prior years or quarters? So I just look at the expense items there and I look for anything jumping out or accelerating or growing at a much faster rate than anything else. So for the most part, looking at the income statement, I am looking for any anomalies or things that might look like a potential red flag. So the last key financial document to cover here, we talked about the balance sheet, the income statement. The final one here is called the cash flow statement. And again, guys, this is pretty intermediate to advanced stuff here. So if you're totally overwhelmed about these uh, financial documents, Really, the only one I recommend learning, uh, if you absolutely had to pick one, would of course be the balance sheet. But if you find this stuff to be interesting, you can always learn a lot by studying these documents of different companies. So the cash flow statement is a quarterly document that provides an update on these three financial statements. Uh, it helps you by understanding these Understanding these three documents allows investors to interpret the quarterly earnings report. So in that report every quarter, they're going to update on those three core financial documents. So more on the cash flow statement and what this is. This cash flow statement shows how changes in the balance sheet have affected cash and cash equivalents. Essentially, cash enters and leaves the company through three different avenues, operations, investing and financing and this paints the overall picture of all cash flowing into and out of a company so as far as operations goes that's going to be everyday functioning of the company ongoing business operations investing is any capital assets or securities uh, any money the company is putting into investments um, looking to you know grow or preserve the value of their money um, and then financing is any capital raising or payment of dividends. That's all going to be outlined and spelled out on that cash flow statement. So between the balance sheet, the income statement, and the cash flow statement, you're gonna get a really good overall picture of the financial health of this company. Now, I know we discussed this earlier, but I wanna circle back to the earnings report and talk more about that now, because again, this is one of the big distinctions between a private company and a public one. So public companies are required to file quarterly um, earning reports and report earnings performance and in doing so, they're going to provide an update to the balance sheet, the um, cash flow statement, and the income statement every three months. So it's a great way to glance and look through this and make sure that your investment is still performing well and you still want to be part of this company. Uh, this report also allows investors to determine the ongoing financial health of a company. The main figures people pay attention to are the earnings per share, revenue, and guidance. So if you don't want to get into any massively difficult analysis, uh, you can pretty much focus on those three things here. Um, earnings per share is the amount of earnings uh, after paying all of the related expenses per share. Then we have the revenue and then we have the guidance. And essentially guidance is when a company gives forward looking assumptions based on how they expect to do in the future. And again, Wall Street analysts base buy and sell recommendations off of these quarterly earnings reports. So you should at the very least have a general idea of your stocks that you own when their earnings report is because at the very least it's good to just tune into it and listen or just be aware that on an earnings day, you could see a lot of movement in that share price. Now in that earnings report, it often provides a comparison to the previous quarter, as well as the year over year comparison, because what they're showing you is how are they doing from a year prior versus the quarter prior. Uh, earnings reports also typically include a narrative from the CEO about what is seen in the report. And the CEO is like the leader, the chief executive officer of a company. Uh, companies also file a document called a 10Q, 
which provides a more comprehensive report. The 10Q usually comes out a few days or weeks following the quarterly earnings report. I don't typically look at that 10Q. Um, I keep an eye on when companies are reporting earnings, and I typically only tune in to like the big earnings reports for like Apple, Microsoft, etc., uh, because these companies tend to be the bellwether uh, for tech in general. So I, I do have like 20 different stocks, 25 or so that I own. I don't go and listen to every earnings report, but I do keep a general idea on what's going on with these companies and I tune in for those big earnings reports. So I know we mentioned this earlier, but I want to briefly talk a bit more about earnings per share. And remember, this is where we derive the P.E. ratio from. You take the price per share divided by the earnings per share, and that gives you the price to earnings ratio. So just to make sure, let's go over quick and explain what earnings per share means. Well, earnings per share is going to be the bread and butter of the quarterly earnings report. It's going to be an indication of what the company earned per share in the previous quarter. So they basically take the total amount of earnings that the company had, which is the money um, after revenue came in, they pay expensive, then they, expenses, and then they pay other things, then they have earnings. This is the earnings per share. Um, it's how much you earned. They take total earnings divided by all shares out there, and that is your earnings per share, which is an indicator of the profitability of a company. Beating or falling under the EPS forecast can send a stock soaring or tumbling, as we talked about earlier. And remember, it is in the best interest of an analyst to provide an accurate estimate. Now, you are going to laugh once you start investing because some of these analysts you look at how wrong they are and you're like, how are they this far off with their guesses about these things? But these are teams of people that literally spend hours a day just researching these companies, selling these reports to Wall Street investors. So this is what they do in and out. But to be honest with you guys, I always like to make my own decisions about my investments. I typically don't really care what analysts have to say. But, you know, it is something to consider that they are placing bets on how they expect a company to perform. And if a company beats or misses those expectations, it can be a very volatile time for a stock. Um, for example, I can remember back at one point when I owned shares of Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, they had an earnings report that fell short of expectations and the stock dropped like 24%. So sometimes there are massive moves surrounding quarterly earnings. And then to share a bit more detail on that guidance, in my opinion, this is probably one of the most important, if not the most important parts of an earnings report known as the company guidance. It's an indication of an estimate. This is simply an estimate of the future earnings performance of that company, and it typically includes revenue, earnings per share, margin, and estimates of ongoing capital expenditures. Guidance is not required, but large reputable companies tend to provide these estimates to investors. Um, there's a lot of talk out there whether or not this forward-looking guidance is even helpful because it typically causes companies to have to make short-term moves to please investors. But for the time being, it's still common for large publicly traded companies to issue forward-looking guidance. So I would always look for a company that is raising guidance. And if you hear about that, if you hear like a company reported earnings and raised guidance, that means that they expect to have better numbers, better sales figures or whatever in the coming months than their original estimate. So that's always a very positive sign to see. So just for a quick recap here of fundamental stock analysis, Number one, learn about the management of a company. Be like Warren Buffett, he invests in good management because they are the captain of the ship. And if management is being dishonest, typically that's gonna be a bad experience as a new investor. Number two, read through the vision or outlook report or the annual report. Um, I always like reading Apple's and a couple of large companies because it gives you a really good idea of what the company is working on and where they are heading. Um, when I say study the balance sheet, really what I mean is look through it once and understand, you know, how much debt does this company have versus assets and, you know, what kind of situation are they in with their money? Uh, analyzing the income statement allows you to understand how you know revenue and sales are growing or changing and is profitability changing as well. 
The cash flow statement is going to help you understand the movement of cash in and out of that company. And then reading the quarterly earnings reports is going to help you stay updated, provide you with updates on those key financial documents. And if you want to uncover even more information, you can wait for that 10Q to come out, which should have even more in-depth information about the company's performance in that previous quarter. So that's the gist on fundamental analysis there, guys. We talked a lot about goodwill as well and how that brand can have a lot of value. And so one thing I wanted to mention as well here is that I always look for companies that have a strong, well-known and reputable brand because that can always help out in terms of you know people continuing to utilize those goods or services. Um, that's why I love Apple. People love the brand, are very loyal to them, and they will likely continue to be for years to come. Also, another thing I want to mention here is I tend to look for companies that do have high barriers to entry, whether it be patents, research and development, talent, etc. I go into a lot more detail about that in my video on how I pick my stocks, and I talk about something called a moat or barriers to entry for a um, for a business. And guys, honestly, like this video is super long as it is, so I had to trim some fat here and there. So if you want to learn more about that check out that other supplemental video. The card is still in the corner. Um, but that's another important factor I look at is the moat that a company has or what is protecting them from new entrants and new competitors. That being said, I want to shift gears now and talk about industries versus sectors and how to do some analysis of um, businesses as a whole in terms of like an entire area of the economy rather than looking at one specific business. So most people blur the lines between sectors and industries and it's kind of important to understand the differences between these two groups because trends can exist within certain sectors and industries. You have something called sector rotation which is when money moves out of one area of the economy and moves into another. For example, we said money was flying into tech over the summer and out of financials. And then the opposite happened where money was flying into financials recently and flowing out of tech. So it's always good to keep an eye on these trends, understand what is the hot sector or industry right now and what is the dog. Because when the sectors rotate and the tables turn, there's always the potential for good opportunities there. So let's start off by talking about what a sector is. A sector is simply a group of related industries and it's a broad group of correlating industries that all follow the same trends. For example, the energy sector includes companies involved with the supply as well as the production of energy. Even though there's two industries in there, electrical supply and electrical uh, production, and then distribution would be a third one, um, you know, those are all correlating together in the same sector, but they're parts of a different industry. Uh, this includes a number of different industries, for example, oil or gas drilling, exploration and refining, integrated power organizations, all of these industries impact the others within the energy sector. So sector is kind of a larger parent category and industry is a smaller child category. And within that industry, you'd have specific businesses um, doing exactly whatever that business activity is. So that is what a sector is. So then we have an industry. An industry is an isolated business activity serving more specific group rather than a whole sector. It's often referred to as a subsector as it is a component of a larger group or like I said, a child category of the larger parent category, which would be a sector. For example, the semiconductor industry is a collection of companies that design and fabricate semiconductor devices. The semiconductor industry is an isolated group of companies within the technology sector. So you can go broad and look at a sector, or you can look at a particular industry falling within that sector. So hopefully you can start to see where there's good potential here to get a bird's eye view of kind of like how all of these different businesses are doing from a top level down. And then you can get more granular and see, okay, within the energy sector, 
what industries are the winners and what are the losers. And then once you pick an industry, you can get more granular and start looking for maybe one of the strongest links of that chain rather than investing in, you know, the, the, the lagger. You want to typically look for one of the leaders of an industry. But now I want to further complicate things here, but it's actually pretty interesting because within industries, there's two main types cyclical industries and then there's defensive industries and um, both are actually good at different times the performance of cyclical industries correlates with the performance of the underlying economy so essentially in a booming economy in a bull market when people have more spending money in their pockets the cyclical industries do very well and they typically outperform the defensive industries However, in a sluggish economy, in a bear market, when people don't have a lot of extra spending money, the cyclical industries underperform the defensive industries because they typically hold up better. Cyclical industries are sensitive, while defensive industries are durable, and we're going to cover examples of both of these shortly. So with defensive industries, goods and services are purchased no matter what the underlying economy is doing. They're more durable, and they typically hold up better in a bear market. During a bull market, these companies tend to underperform uh, or not do as well as the broad market or these uh, cyclical industries because more spending is not necessarily directed to these industries. So just to give you an example here, a defensive industry would be consumer staples, um, and we're going to use Procter & Gamble because Procter & Gamble makes a lot of toothpaste and personal hygiene products. So for example, we don't brush our teeth 10 times a day in a booming economy. We're still going to just brush our teeth, you know, hopefully twice a day, maybe once a day. Just because the economy is doing good, you're not going to celebrate by doing extra toothbrushing. Maybe you should, but most people wouldn't. Meanwhile, though, if we're talking about like Hilton stock or like an airline stock, we do travel and spend more money at restaurants and bars in a good economy. So when the economy's good, we're going to see about the same level of spending directed towards defensive industries. And when the economy is bad, we're going to see about the same level of spending directed to those industries. Like you're going to buy toilet paper no matter what the underlying economy is doing. So if you like that idea, I really do enjoy investing in defensive industries. The only issue is when we're in a long bull market, they tend to underperform. So one of my favorite defensive stocks that I own is National Grid. It's a utility stock, very boring, very consistent investment. But I would challenge you guys, you know, take a peek at the performance of that stock and how utility stocks held up during the global pandemic because most of them did not sell off nearly as much as the tech stocks or some of these more cyclical industries. Now, this is one word of caution I want to give you here, and it's about a quote which is, a rising tide lifts all boats. Oftentimes, when there's sector rotation going on and money is flowing out of one area and into another, um, all of the companies within that sector or industry are going to do well too. And so... Oftentimes, some companies that may not be the most quality investments will have their share prices rising as well just because of the prevailing trend and the rising tide lifting up all boats. However, this is why it's so important to understand how to perform some basic fundamental analysis because let's say, for example, you want to invest in uh, technology and you want to invest in the semiconductor industry there's a lot of different chip companies you could choose from so rather than just throwing a dart at the board it's good to be able to understand okay let me look at which ones pay dividends how long have they paid those dividends Cool. All right. Let's look at the P.E. ratio and then compare it to the P.E.G. Maybe one company has a high P.E. ratio, but a lower P.E.G. because they're expected to do better in the future. So now that you understand how to conduct some basic fundamental analysis, you can figure out what industry or sector is doing well. Find a bunch of companies in that area of business and then skim through them and do a little bit of analysis to understand, you know, which one may be the strongest link of that chain. So here is two pieces of advice I have here, guys, not financial advice. Obviously, this is just what's worked well for me in the past. 
Um, again, always do your own research before picking stocks, guys, but this is what has worked well for me. If you are looking at a defensive industry, look for the well-established leaders with a long track record of success. That is typically what I look for in a defensive industry. So for example, with consumer staples, Procter & Gamble, one of the stocks I own, is a perfect fit because they are an established leader with a very long track record of success. If you're looking at a cyclical industry, I always say look for the innovators, the leaders, the ones on the cutting edge. That's typically what I look for because that often translates to growth. However, there is one caveat there. Be careful with those innovative companies because they often end up being the market high flyers. Make sure you're also combining that with fundamental analysis, looking at the PE, PEG ratio, and just making sure that the stock is not totally overvalued before you begin purchasing shares. Also, another question I like to ask myself when um, looking for new investments is who has possible solutions to the big problems or mega trends? So I sit down and I think about what are the biggest problems socially that we're facing right now and who is poised well to solve them? That is oftentimes a good way to like unearth companies that you may have never ordinarily thought of to invest in. But I try to, you know, think about things in more of a backwards way than most people would in terms of finding stocks to invest in. And in terms of mega trends, you guys can Google that and look at what are some of these current trends right now that are going to be going on for the next 10, 15 years. So we talked about this earlier, but I want to briefly touch on again, sector rotation. It's one of my favorite uh, phenomenons because it allows you to potentially unearth some opportunities. Sector rotation is often a great strategy for more active investors who don't want to just put their money in index funds or ETFs for the next 15 years. This is the process of moving investments from one industry or sector to another based on the underlying economic trends. For example, if an investor, for example, if investor sentiment is looking bearish, you could rotate sectors and move away from the cyclical industries and invest in the defensive industries. So I'm, I typically would not recommend making any jump or rash decisions, but let's say, for example, you loaded up on tech stocks and then three months later you were up like 40 or 50% and you were getting nervous you could sell off some of those profits and instead put that money in a defensive industry or sector or something else that you think might do better later. So for me, as I said, I bought tech early over the summer of 2020. It pushed up. I had major gains, sold them off and rotated into financials. Then money moved over to financials. I sold off some of the Bank of America stock, rolled it back into blue chip tech because of the fact that it was selling off. So I don't make these moves very often, maybe like two, three times a year. Um, but it is a way to potentially, you know, add some value to your portfolio if you can keep up with these broad market trends. So now what we're going to cover here is an index, just so you guys have a better idea where this term is derived from and what exactly it means. An index summarizes the performance of a group of securities or stocks. Major indexes summarize the performance of an entire group, and there's indexes for certain classifications, such as um, what exchange they trade on in a given market region. So there's all kinds of indexes out there. They can track U.S. listed stocks, um, Toronto stocks, uh, Chinese stocks. There's all kinds of indexes out there, but the main ones that we use here in the U.S., are the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, and then the S&P 500 as an index of all of these stocks. It tracks the performance of all of them and gives us a benchmark on how these broad markets are doing. And then we have benchmarks from exchanges all over the world so we can compare the U.S. markets to the European markets, the global markets, etc., etc. So that is the usefulness of an index but not only can you just use an index to view a overall snapshot of the whole market, you're also able to invest directly in indexes in a very low fee manner and purchase a little piece of all of those different companies. So just for example here, guys, 
The NASDAQ is a major exchange in the US. If you wanted to own every share of companies in the NASDAQ, you could purchase the Fidelity NASDAQ Composite ETF and own a small piece of every little company and big company on the NASDAQ. Uh, the next one here, the S&P 500, that is the 500 largest publicly traded companies. One of the most popular investments out there is VOO, the Vanguard 500 ETF, low fees. You simply own a small piece of the 500 largest publicly traded companies. The cool thing is too, these ETFs typically pay dividends. So every quarter, all of those small dividends that you earn from those hundreds of companies get pooled together. You earn one big dividend um, collectively from all of those companies. And then you can either take that money and direct it elsewhere or reinvest that money back into the ETF to earn compound interest. So this slide here, guys, just shows you a couple of popular Vanguard ETFs, just so you see some options of what's available out there with the corresponding expense ratio. And guys, honestly, as far as ETFs go, you really can't go wrong with Vanguard or BlackRock or a lot of Fidelity or Schwab products. They're all pretty low expense ratios these days. And we're talking about, you know, less than 0.1 of a percent for some of these funds. Um, I'm not gonna go through them, but you can pause this if you want to look through these. And just so you see, you know, there's um, U.S. markets, total world stock, emerging markets, bond markets. There's a REIT ETF. And even within Vanguard, they have industry and sector specific ETFs. So if you wanted to just invest in financials as a whole, there's a Vanguard ETF that allows you to own a small piece of all of the financial companies. So you can pick a stock if you wanna to try to pick one winner of the group, or if you just think an entire area of the economy is gonna do well, you can just buy an ETF. And if the whole sector or industry does well, you do well too. Now, if you're looking to do some research on ETFs, I like the Sector ETF channel. They're not a sponsor. They haven't paid me and it's a completely free service. ETF.com slash channels slash sectors. It gives you a really good way to sort through all kinds of different ETFs available. And there may be ETFs that you have never even come across. That being said, watch out for anything that's leveraged. You see this bullish 3X right here. That means that there's actually leverage at play in that ETF, which simply means it's going to move up or down at a multiple of whatever the underlying uh, thing it's tracking does. So just be careful with that. I don't get into any leveraged ETFs or inverse ETFs. Um, I would 100% uh, recommend stay away from them. And if you decide to do them, do a lot of research. So if you see like 3X or leveraged or inverse or short, things like that, that's not the type of ETF you want to buy. And obviously, guys, before you pick a random ETF to invest in, make sure you do some research on it and fully understand how this investment vehicle works and what has to happen in the market for you to make money from this um, particular investment. Okay, guys, so now we're going to cover investment taxes. I know this is probably a boring subject, but I'm going to show you how to maximize the amount of money you keep in your pocket with investments in the stock market. Because at the end of the day, what you keep is more important than what you make. This is going to be an overview of the taxes you will pay likely as an investor, the most common ones for common situations. However, this is not a replacement for a consultation with a tax advisor. I am not a tax advisor, and this is not gonna be like individual specific advice for any one person. I always recommend seeking out the advice of a qualified tax professional. So essentially with taxes associated with the stock market, taxes incurred from investments are not created equally and the way the current tax system is written it favors long-term investing strategies not to mention if you learn the actual tax brackets what you often find is that the more money you make the more savings there is associated with being a long-term investor versus a short-term trader so this is why i follow a mostly long-term investing strategy because i want to make sure that i'm keeping most of what I'm earning rather than earning a lot but giving most of it away in taxes. So essentially, your investments can be taxed as ordinary income 
or long-term capital gains depending on how long you've held on to that investment. As far as ordinary income, that's the same tax rate you're paying from the income from your job. If your investments fall under the classification of ordinary income, they are taxed at the same rate as your wages. Unfortunately, this is the highest tax rate you will ever pay as an investor for most cases, and it is in your best interest to minimize this taxation. The two types of profits recognized that fall under this are dividends as well as short-term capital gains. However, there is something called qualified dividends, which is another story. So when you own dividend stocks long-term, they eventually become qualified dividends, which have a favorable tax situation as well. So you get the best of both worlds, in my opinion, with dividend investing because you can get long-term capital gains and qualified dividends, which is a lot less than you're paying compared to the amount of ordinary income tax you would pay on short-term capital gains. So if a stock is purchased and sold within 12 months, it is going to be taxed as ordinary income at the same tax rate as the income from your job. This is calculated using the date of the order execution, not the settlement date. The taxation system favors investors who hold on to stocks for greater than one year as traders are always taxed at the ordinary income rate. So if you do hear about people talking about day trading or swing trading, you can kind of quietly laugh to yourself because you understand they are paying the maximum possible taxes because all of this is short-term capital gains. The real money, trust me guys, is all long-term capital gains, qualified dividends, things like that, that allow you to avoid putting a lot of that money back into the government's pocket through taxes. Also, if you do plan on doing any type of active trading, I would highly recommend doing so within the Roth IRA retirement account as tax sheltered accounts do not incur a short term capital gains tax. So let's say, for example, you want to do some short term trades, but you don't necessarily want to pay taxes. You could literally do that with your Roth IRA if you wanted to place more active trades with that. And then if you have a ton of short term capital gains, as long as you follow those requirements we talked about earlier, and it's a Roth IRA, you're never going to have to pay those taxes. So one one of the easiest ways to cut down on your tax bill is to go long and it also cuts down on your stress. If you hold a stock for longer than 12 months, it is going to be taxed as a long-term capital gain. The long-term capital gains tax rate has brackets based on your ordinary income tax rate. However, there are some important details to cover here related to investment taxation. First of all, you are only taxed when you sell or once a gain or loss is realized. This is a major misconception out there. People think that just because they bought a stock and the stock went up that they automatically have to pay taxes. But what you have there is something called an unrealized capital gain and you have to realize that gain by actually selling some or all of those shares and your profit or the difference between what you bought for and what you sold for is the amount that you pay taxes on. Depending on how long you held that, it's either going to be short-term, maximum tax rate, or long-term capital gains. So it's very important to keep track of how long you have held onto an investment and consider the tax advantage of going long, especially if you're somebody who's in the upper tax brackets. Also, capital gains from a short sale are always taxed as ordinary income, regardless of the duration. So just to give you guys an example here of how this could save you money, let's say your income is taxed at 35%, and your short-term capital gains tax rate is the same at 35%. However, your long-term capital gains tax rate is just 15%. So let's say, for example, you sold the stock on day 365, which means you did not hold it for longer than one year, and you recognize the capital gain of $10,000, you're going to pay 35% tax on that or $3,500. But let's say instead you waited just one more day and sold on day 366. You had the same capital gain of $10,000, but you only paid 15%. 
because that is now a long-term capital gain. You just went from paying 3,500 bucks in taxes to $1,500. In this bracket, the tax advantage would be 20%. Um, this is based on a couple of years ago. I'm not sure if these brackets have changed, but this was a real example um, from when I did this here. So I recommend looking at the tax bracket yourself and comparing your short-term versus long-term capital gains rate. And the difference between the, the two is the amount that you save by going long. And then there's another fun category called the capital loss. If you lose money on an investment and you recognize a loss by selling, this is considered to be a capital loss. And a capital loss is typically deductible. And a capital loss is typically deductible and it can be used to offset other income from a capital gain. There are limitations to what you can deduct from your taxes. So again, talk to your tax advisor, but based on the current tax rules, you can deduct $3,000 of capital losses from your taxes each year, and anything above and beyond that can be deducted in the following years. So where this becomes relevant is oftentimes you'll find that investors will unload a position in maybe like, you know, November, December, or January, or so where this comes into play is sometimes you'll find investors unloading positions in November or December that they've held on to all year. They've been waiting to see what they do. And if it ended up being a losing position and they changed their mind, a lot of people sell their crap in November and December and take a loss to offset capital gains for that tax year or potentially take a small loss to offset some of their other income. So I don't recommend it. It's still a loss. You're still losing money. But just understand that if you, if you do lose money on a stock, it will offset your total capital gains. Anyways, guys, there you have it. Thank you so much for sticking around here. I really hope I added a ton of value here to you guys um, in this video. Like I said, um, there's no pitch, there's no course, nothing like that here, guys. This right here is as close as it comes to a full-blown course for you. Um, I really hope this helped you out. If you want to help me out in return, number one, maybe share this video with a friend or if you happen to be on, you know, stock trading forums or discords, you know, pass the video around. That way other people can see it and learn from this resource. I'm also going to give you guys a couple of bonuses here if you want them. Number one, the entire slideshow presentation is available for free right now for download you don't even have to sign up for anything that's going to be down in the description below if you want a full copy of this presentation also as I mentioned I'm putting together a free resource updating you on the most current best stock promotions if you're looking to get some free stocks for signing up for a brokerage i'm going to update that at least every month with the most current promotions to make sure you guys are getting the best of what's available there's a lot of free stock offers there like i said companies like robin hood and m1 finance they're also you know looking to um uh, grow their customer base and they're all competing with each other. Uh, I also have links to that full video on how I pick my stocks for beginners. Um, that's a good supplement to this as well as a full 50 minute video specifically on my style of dividend investing. I invest with M1 Finance. That's the brokerage I use. I also have a free training down below in the description that will walk you through step by step how I got started with my six figure dividend stock portfolio. And then lastly, guys, if you're looking to do some research on different investing apps out there, hop on over to investingsimple.com and we'll be sure to help you out with navigating you towards, you know, the best app based on your needs. But thank you so much, guys, for sticking around. If you made it to the very end, drop me a comment with your favorite color. I'm always curious how many people actually make it. Um, subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that bell for future notifications, and I hope to see you guys in the next video.